Well, I want to say, as, um, as we're getting started here for just a moment, what a privilege and an honor it is, without question, to be here among God's people. To be asked to come and do something like this uh, makes me a nervous wreck. I just want you to know that. Uh, so uh, I'm going to do the best that I can, though. I, I, I believe wholeheartedly in this, what I'm getting ready to tell you. What I want to do before I get started with that, obviously, is get some thank yous out of the way. This congregation, thank you for standing for the truth. And I want you to understand that this is a worthy fight. Amen. Our congregation in Indianapolis came to this truth in July about of 2016, so we're not quite two years into this. That's just about the time that I came to this. Of course, I, I had seen uh, the truth of the scriptures. I'm, when we talk about eschatology, and we talk about AD 70 and preterism, my friends, those are just terms to describe <coughs> Bible truth, and that's what this is. So, so we started seeing these things, and um, it has been just, just a wonderful journey for our family to travel this whole time. It's, it's just, it, it, I can't even describe it in words. It's just so fantastic. And we've gained, we've lost some, we've gained some new brethren who uh, uh, were in the area and, and thought they were just all alone. Ask Robert, he'll, he'll tell you that. Uh, I want to thank uh, Brent and Sherry so much. They have fed us and fed us and fed us <laughs> and fed us. Uh, so so we're, we're very thankful for that and the hospitality. And I don't travel well. Um, so usually what happens when I get someplace, it takes me three or four days before I start feeling like myself again. So here it is, the third day. I'm doing good. So now I get to go home tomorrow and <laughs> it's just started. Uh, so... Um, um, Steve made a comment about, well, we haven't seen you since you just come out of your shell every once in a while and down there in the pool house where, where we're staying. Um, I have slept and slept and slept and slept trying to get deal with it. Well, by the way, what is the deal with these roads that do this? I mean, <laughs> uh, in Indiana, all roads are straight and then you take a left turn or a right turn. That's it. <laughs> so uh, not here. And I don't do well with that. But uh, I wanted to see those trees. That's one of the things, the sequoias. That's one of the things that I've wanted to do my whole life. So I'm going to act. I'm going to have to wait until they develop beaming technology where they can just beam it <laughs> right in there. I want to say also, um, maybe make a comment or two, that uh, I'm going to be merciful to you all. Time-wise, this is always a constraint. But there's one thing, this <coughs> has occurred to me, there's one thing that I know all the guys who stood up here today preaching from a preterist standpoint um, agree with our futurist brethren on, and that is the fact that a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day when it comes to their time in preaching. So, <laughs> so uh, outside of that, I, uh, I'll just keep it to normal time. I, I, I'll try. And, and one other thing before I get started with my topic in Luke chapter 21 is this. I know that this morning I'm standing simply before the great, and that makes me nervous. Well, I'm not talking about any of these preachers here. They're just men. I'm standing before God Almighty, Amen. and I have a responsibility to teach what is right. And every week, hundreds of times on Facebook, <laughs> we do, Trent and I do this, this program on Facebook every Tuesday night, by the way, at John Watson on Facebook. You might check that out at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you're just in your commute back from work here, I'm, I'm assuming. But you might check that out, and it's archived, of course, and it's also archived on Restoration Movement 2.0 on uh, YouTube, so you can check that out. But uh, so anyway, we get all of these these comments, and people remind me every week how I'm standing before God, and and you know I need to teach the truth. Well, what they don't understand is I am teaching the truth. Mm -hmm. This is the reason that I made such a radical departure from <clears throat> what I believed before. Because the power of the point, you notice I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm just going to try to make powerful points. <coughs> I'm not tech, not tech, you know, I'm not a tech guy. I can't even hardly say it. And people remind me of that, and I'm standing before God, and I'm going to teach you what the scriptures teach, and nothing but that. 
So let's get into this. Luke chapter 21 is my assigned topic. And what we see in Luke 21 is uh, the Olivet Discourse. Of course, we can find the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25, um, well, really part of 23. We see it in Mark 13, and we also see John's version in the book of, not John, but Revelation. Revelation is the Olivet Discourse on steroids. <laughs> you know, it, it's, a, it's just a lot more detail there. So that's essentially what it is. But Luke's version is very interesting. There's a lot of things here that we can see. And I'm just going to go through this one word at a time and describe every one of those words in 45 minutes. Just kidding. <laughs> I know that's not going to happen. What I want to start with is something that um, is right at the beginning. Verse chapter 21, of course, Luke, verse 1. He looked up and he saw the rich putting in their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And then he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they all out of their surplus put into the offering. But she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. Now why on God's green earth, or brown earth here? <laughs> it's green. <laughs> it's green, but uh, yeah. See, I'm used to corn. Everywhere I go, there's corn. Uh, so, but that's okay. Uh, so, so why would... This woman put in everything that she had to live on into the temple treasury. Why would she do that? Well, I want to read something for you from uh, George uh, Peter Halford. This is the destruction of Jerusalem. I'm going to take just a moment to do this because I think this will help us understand what we're talking. Because here we see, unlike the other two accounts, we see Jesus speaking in the temple. Okay? So he starts out in the temple and he's, he's witnessing these things there. So here's what we need to understand about the temple. In the front, uh, this is uh, George Peter Holford's description of this. In the front, spacious and lofty galleries, wainscoted with cedar, were supported by columns of white marble in uniform rows. In short, says Josephus, nothing could surpass even the exterior of this temple for its elegant, curious workmanship. It was adorned with solid plates of gold that rivaled the beauty of the rising sun and were scarcely less dazzling to the eye than the beams of that luminary. Of those parts of the building which were not gilt, when viewed from a distance, some, says he, appeared like pillars of snow and some like mountains of white marble. The splendor of the interior parts of the temple corresponded with its external magnificence. It was decorated and enriched by everything that was costly, elegant, and superb. Religious donations and offerings had poured into this wonderful repository of precious stores from every part of the world during many successive ages. In the lower temple, there were placed those sacred curiosities, the seven-branched candlestick of pure gold, the table of the showbread, the altar of incense, the two latter of which were covered with plates of the same metal. In the sanctuary were several doors, 55 cubits high and 16 uh, in breadth. In other words, about 80 feet high per door and 24 feet wide, um, if a cubit is 18 inches, uh, which were all likewise of gold, these doors. Before these uh, doors hung a veil of the most beautiful Babylonian tapestry, composed of scarlet, blue, and purple, exquisitely interwoven and wrought up to the highest degree of art. From the top of the ceiling depended branches and leaves of vines and large clusters of grapes hanging down five or six feet, all of gold, and of most admirable workmanship. In addition to these proofs of the splendor and riches of the temple may be noticed its eastern gate of pure Corinthian brass, more esteemed even than the precious metals. The golden folding doors of the chambers, the beautiful carved work, gilding and painting of all the galleries, golden vessels, etc., of the sanctuary, the sacerdotal vestments of scarlet, violet, and purple, the vast wealth of the treasury, abundance of precious stones and immense qual uh, quantities of all kinds of costly spices and perfumes. Um, in short, the most valuable and sumptuous of whatever nature or art or opulence could supply was enclosed within the consecrated walls of this magnificent and venerable edifice. That is the reason this good-hearted widow cast in all that she had because their identity was in that temple. 
They identified very closely with that. They were very proud of that. This thing was amazing. So when you, as we're reading through this, and we go through these questions that the, uh, really it's just one question, um, that the apostles asked about this temple, now you've got a little bit of a picture of what this thing looked like and why it was so important to them. And its destruction would have been devastating. For them to think that this thing could be destroyed <coughs> would be devastating. I actually had a man tell me that, uh, I, I'm not going to, I need to keep this one secret, so I'll do that. But, but uh, I will say this. He had a discussion over this very topic, and this was before I was uh, convinced, actually. He actually said that the people in the first century could have, listen to this, cared less about the temple. <laughs> Unbelievable. And this is a man who's the lifetime card-carrying member of the COC. And so he actually said that. And I know that as I talk to people, they just do not get this concept of how important this building, this material thing was to them. Now let's examine some of the evidence about this. Verse 5 says, while some were talking about the temple. So here they are talking about the temple. Now you know what they were talking about. So here they were saying things like, well, look, look at this. Uh, one, there was one tower of Antonia that had marble at its base. And this is how, how uh, exquisite this was. They actually polished this marble so smooth that you couldn't even walk on it. So they made this tower kind of impenetrable because you couldn't, this is one of its defenses. And this is what it looked like. So when they were talking about this thing, and, and from now on, when you hear this, I think you're gonna remember about this temple and what it looked like. And you should really study about this. Um, that book by uh, George Peter Halford is, is very good, The Destruction of Jerusalem. Um, it's written in 1799, I think. It's just, just excellent. Anyway, so here they were uh, talking about the temple and how it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts. So now you've got a little bit of a picture of what they're talking about. As for those things which you are looking at, Jesus says, the days will come in which there will not be one stone left upon another in which will not be torn down. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine how they would have felt? <coughs> no, Lord, there's no way that this is ever going to happen again. Of course, it happened a couple times before. And they had just spent, what, 46 years rebuilding this thing? And just about got it to the point, as we look back in history, just about got it to the point where it was done, if, if something like that was ever done. <coughs> And then, then it was totally destroyed, never to be rebuilt again. That's significant. The scriptures teach that that temple would never be rebuilt again. Now, let me illustrate this. If we look at Matthew chapter 24, um, in the parallel here, understand this. Verse 15 says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand that those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. <coughs> He says, Daniel prophesies about this. In Daniel, the 12th chapter, this is what he's talking about. I mean, I know this might be elementary to so many people here, but to me, I'm telling you what, this is earth shattering. When I saw this, I was just literally blown away. So Daniel chapter 12, notice what, what is said here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left toward the heaven and swore by him who lived forever and ever would be for a time, times and half a time. And Holger covered this bit, and I think Steve and I think uh, Don and I think William all <laughs> covered this. Uh, so I won't spend a lot of time here. Um, for time, times, and half a time, and as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all of these events will be completed. Well, what is the power of the holy people? Well, it wasn't the temple necessarily, although that was part of it. We'll see this as we go by the time we end. But it was the law. If you look at Romans chapter 3, I believe this is, it says that this power of the holy people was this word that was given to them. I want to read this to you. So let me get over here. Um... Romans chapter 3, verse 2 says, Great in every respect, first of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And if you look at verse 1, it says, What advantage has the Jew? Or what benefit the circumcision? So they trusted in the law. There was their power. And this was going to be completely shattered in the first century. 
And Jesus said, this is getting ready to come. Let's continue with our look at Luke chapter 21. So in verse 7 it says, They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign of these things that are about to take place? Now you notice he really only asks two, they only ask two questions, if, if you want to look at it that way. Matthew records it as three questions, if you want to look at it that way. But this is just one question. The one question is, no way. When's this going to happen? And Jesus answers that question throughout the rest of this. He expands upon this. Let's look at these things. He said, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying that I am he. The time is near. Do not go after them. When you, go, uh, when you hear of wars and, and disturbances or wars and rumors of wars, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, and then the end does not, or about the end does not follow immediately. So he says there are things that have to take place before the end comes. Now he's put, putting all of these things in one time period. The end does not come 2,000 or 2 million or 200 billion years later. Now, folks, we have to be realistic here. If the Lord has tarried for 2,000 years when he said it was soon, I don't get that one. Never got that one. That never made sense. The preacher would stand up in the pulpit and they would preach, the Lord's coming soon. He's coming in our generation. It's been too fat. Wait a minute. He's coming in our generation? Where does it say that? When we read the scriptures, we read audience relevance teaches us what audience relevance is. We're opening someone else's mail. These are letters to people in the first century. And we're reading their mail. So we need to understand their terminology, their language. And because we don't, we have just really migrated off the path. We're not even on it anymore in, in many respects. Because we look at, at words and phrases and idioms in our language, not in theirs. And that really, really messes us up. I don't want to get too far off the trail here. So he says the time is near. Okay, so he says... Don't listen to these people, these false Christs, these false messiahs. Josephus records, and, and I'm not up here to preach Josephus, trust me. Um, the scriptures are sufficient for this. But, you know, if we've got historical evidence, why not look at it and use it? Josephus records, and, and I'm sure that there are others that record this too, that, that I've read, that there were many, many, many people who claimed to be the messiah. Now, my brain, the, the way I'm, I'm wired backwards from all of you in here. So I, I see things a lot different. Um, so my brain is going, okay, so if they were looking for all these messiahs and all these people felt that they could pass themselves off as messiah, doesn't that mean that the general population realized that this was a special time? They had to be seeing this. Why? Because they read and understood the Old Testament. They understood what we call, or what, what well, we don't really call it this, but it's what's called the Tanakh. It stands for Torah, I think, uh, I think Don might have mentioned this yesterday, Torah, uh, Nevi'im, and uh, Ketubim. What this is, uh, so they kind of do what we do with like J-Lo and that kind of stuff, you know, put it all in, <laughs> into one kind of terminology. So uh, Torah, Tanakh. And, but this is the, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So this is everything. That's significant because when we see that all these things are going to be destroyed and Jesus said, I came to fulfill all of these things, that's what he's talking about. Nothing is going to be left out. I don't know what else all means unless you want to view it as, well, Adam didn't really die in the garden that day because God said he would, but he didn't. Soon doesn't mean soon because God said it was soon, but he didn't really mean soon. And then all doesn't really mean all because we can't trust God to tell us what he wants us to know. That's nuts, people. We have this paradigm that we have a, just we have just embraced this and hugged this in the Lord's church that they didn't in the first century. They did not do these things. They didn't see that that way. And people often ask me, well, how could we have been wrong for 2,000 years? Let me explain this. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4 teaches clearly. Uh, also, uh, uh, William talked about this in 2 Thessalonians 2. That there will come this time where there's a, a departure, an apostasy. Now, I'm not going to say the church went into apostasy because that wouldn't make sense. But there were a lot of people who were part of these things that were going on who started believing lies <coughs> right immediately. 
So why is it right after the destruction of Jerusalem, people start teaching that there's a physical resurrection? We see this in the patristics. Why is that? Well, because they went into apostasy, just like that. I mean, right in the first century, they started believing things that were wrong. Did the church? No. Now, here's how I know that. Because they got out when, when they listened to their Savior. When Jesus said, uh, when you see the circles, or the, the, I'm sorry, the city being encircled by armies, it's time to get out. So what did the faithful do? They left. And that's according to Isaiah chapter 26. There are people who can see the truth, but they don't see it. They don't get it. They've got eyes, but they don't see it. They've got ears, but they don't hear it. They don't understand it. It's not evident to them. Let's keep on moving. He says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars of these disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place. But the first of the does not follow immediately. So I want to talk about this. I know that it's very common for us to think that, that um, there's always war. This is constantly war. Well, in the first century, this was not the case. We can read in history of something that's called the Pax Romana. And this is a relative uh, period of, of peace um, for about 200 years, started with Augustus. Now, it's not that there weren't skirmishes and there weren't these things going on, but this would have been very new, not the, the common thing for these people to understand. So when Jesus says, hey, don't freak out about this because you're not used to this, I think maybe that's why he might have been referring to this relative time, or this time of relative peace going on at that point in history. So, verse 10, he says, then uh, he continued on, uh, continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines, plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. So let's stop at this section for just a moment. Um, I didn't really spend a lot of time talking about the end. I think the end has been covered pretty good. Um, so Peter said, hey, the end is, is near. How, how do we get around that? <coughs> if near means 2,000 to 200 billion years, then uh, Peter got it wrong by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Just saying. Okay, so what about these famines and these terrors and these great signs from heaven? Again, we could go to history and we could see that in this time period that there were lots of extra terrible things taking place that hadn't before and maybe haven't since. But that's really not what we're after here. These physical things, yes, were coming upon Jerusalem and, and Israel specifically. So Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. The temple was going to be destroyed, never to be rebuilt. It would remain desolate. This would be a time that would, um, would never happen again, Jesus says. So that's kind of really what we're concerned about. Let's move on to verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering to you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony, so that you make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I'll give you utterance and wisdom, um, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you'll be hated by all because of my name, yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Now, let's think about some of the things here in this section. So what Jesus is actually doing, now let's keep in mind, Jesus is talking, he's sitting down, he's having a discussion with these men. So this is things that are significant to them. And I think this becomes evident the more that we look at these things. So these things are significant to them. And one of the things that I want to point out very first off is this, this great signs. <coughs> what are these great signs? Well, let's flip over, flip, flip over to John chapter 20. I think that this... This is, this is pretty significant here, so let's look at this. John chapter 20, notice in verse 30, it says, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe, and that, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you have life in His name. So what are the, what's the purpose of all these things? Now I get this a lot too. 
Well, if everything came to an end and judgment happened in 70 and the resurrection happened in 70, then why are we still here? Now, now these guys did a great job explaining that, but let me point something out. This is God's eternal purpose. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, there, let's go over here. Let's deviate for just a moment. There's a couple things that I think are really important to look at here in Ephesians. So this is Ephesians 3, and I just want to show you that what, what this means about God's eternal purpose. Okay, so in Ephesians <coughs> chapter 3, notice what he says here. For this reason, in verse 1, he says, I'm Paul, I'm this prisoner, and I'm here for the sake of the Gentiles, he says. So he says, if you've heard of the stewardship of God and God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief by referring to this when you read you may understand my insight in the mystery of Christ. Now notice what he says. In other generations were not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed. Are you getting this? Okay, so this purpose is for who? Guess what? What category do I fall in? 49 year old white guy losing his hair? Um, I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. I don't know if anyone else falls into that category. I hope you don't, not specifically anyway. But so notice what he says. He says, this was in accordance, verse 11, with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, he's talking about the church, verse 10, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose. The church is the eternal purpose. Now, when is this church going to come to an end? Let's see if we can find some passages real quick that talk about the church coming to an end. Well, we can find all kinds of passages, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, very easily teach us that this king is going to be set up. It will never have an end, right? We don't have to go back over that, spend all this time in this. Well, actually, we can look right here in Ephesians and see the same thing. Look at chapter 2, and notice what he says in verse... Uh, let me start at verse 4. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. This is the same thing he just said in chapter 3. Made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now notice verse 7. So that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. And kindness toward us in Christ. So when did, where are these ages to come? They were still in that old law. The end had not come yet. And he said these ages to come. Now when they use this plural term of ages, it's signifying this kind of, uh, in the Greek language, and this is the only way I know how to say this. This is how they would say forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Signifying endlessness. It's not multiple ages. This is how they said it. That was the purpose of God, the eternal purpose. That's the church. That's why we're still here. That's why after judgment was pronounced on Jerusalem and Israel, that life continued. Now, I don't even have time to develop all that. I'm going to get through this in a day or a thousand years. <laughs> but a couple other points I want to make here in this section. Now, if those signs weren't clear enough, what about the signs of Jerusalem being encircled? I mean, look at verse 20. He says in verse 20, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. We're going to spend just a little bit of time on this, because I, I think this is one of, the, one of the big points about, obviously this is a big point about uh, Luke 21. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Now, there's only one thing that I have to say about this. From my standpoint, being a child of the 80s, okay, so you're going to recognize this terminology. There's one thing I have to say about this. When you see the army circling Jerusalem, recognize that her desolation is near. Duh. I mean, really? Um, and I'm not trying to be irreverent to God. And, and what Jesus said, but wouldn't you think when the armies come and surround the city that you should get out of there if it's possible because some bad things are going to happen? Now, Jesus had to point this out to them. 
Again, I think that this lends credence to this idea of the Pax Romana, how, how maybe they thought, well, this is, you know, they'll be okay. These things don't really happen a whole lot. As a matter of fact, what we see that, that we had the Christians leaving and many of the other Jews coming in, according to Josephus. And they came into the city. Why? Because it was a fortified city. They had slippery marble. And they thought, hey, Rome cannot come in here and take this city. So we'll be safe. Little did they know that they wouldn't because they didn't listen. They didn't hear. I want to talk about this just a moment. Okay, so this city is going to be encircled. And the army is going to come around this city. No. Is that a sign or is that not a sign? Yeah, I said that Revelation was the all of that discourse. Let's look at this. This is Revelation chapter 20. And when you see here, <laughs> this just this just blows me away. Now, one of the things that I always found interesting was my amillennial brethren would say, well, everything in Revelation, from Revelation chapter 1 all the way through 19, some of them, or 20, some of them, uh, has already taken place. And then the last three chapters are dealing with the three questions, or dealing with the end of time, that last part of the third question, I guess is how they would put it. Oh, really? Okay, so let's, let's see this. Verse 7 of Revelation 20. Um, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The numbers of them is like the sand of the seashore. And, and let's stop right here. Boy, this sounds really interesting, doesn't it? Gog and Magog and this war and, and the thousand years. This is just really one of those cryptic things. And, and we can read anything that we want to in this. <coughs> but we want to read the scriptures into this. When are these events going to take place? I'm not going to spend time, and I probably couldn't do this justice to nowhere near like some of these guys could hear about Gog and Magog and, and all these other things. But let's see it in a simple way. On my radio program on uh, TFC, um, I have said that uh, I'm the practical preterist. I, I see preterism as practical. It has application for us. And we can see how it applies to us. And if we can't see how it applies to us, then I think we're still missing the point of the scriptures, um, even yet today. So let's keep on reading. And they came up to the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So when were these events of, of the thousand years and Gog and Magog and so forth? When the city surrounded. Isn't this exactly what Jesus said? Now, the funny thing about this is we can look at plenty of other passages, and we're going to do this. Come over here with me to Zechariah. Zechariah teaches this same thing. Is going to happen. Ready for this? This is Zechariah chapter 12. In verse 3, it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who will lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Okay, so here we have this, this, um, Zach, this um, gathering together. And what's going to happen? When is this? In that day. What is the day here that he's talking about? This gathering of these nations, this uh, that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 25, this circling the city, and all of these things taking place. When is this going to happen? Daniel said it's going to happen when? In the first century. Let's examine that briefly again. Daniel chapter 12. Let's look at this. So Daniel chapter 12, at the very beginning, let's, let's exegete Daniel 12 in less than two minutes. Okay? <laughs> Okay, so in the couple, first couple of verses, he's talking about resurrection taking place and judgment. And he says, notice what he says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard against the sons of your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the book will be rescued. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These are everlasting life and others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. This is the resurrection of the just and the unjust. This is John chapter 5. No question about it. And every time we see this idea of the good people being resurrected and the bad people being resurrected, to put it in simple terms, this is where it emanates from, Daniel chapter 12. And when are these things supposed to take place? 
Let's look at this again. When the power of the holy people is completely shattered. Now, what is the power of the holy people? Who are the holy people? If the holy people are the Christians somewhere in the future, then we're going to have to take the Bible and shred it up. Amen. It can't be them. That's right. We're going to have to rebuild Jerusalem when Jesus said that this would never happen again. Now, either we're going to believe what Jesus said or we're going to take the ideas of men and we're just going to embrace them and love them and hug them and squeeze them and make them our little pet, you know? Wasn't there a cartoon that did something like that? <laughs> I knew somebody would know. And, or we're just going to have to listen to the Scriptures and take Jesus at His word. So when Jesus says things, this is one of the things that look at Matthew 16. I mean, when you see this with your eyes and it registers in your brain and then the wheels start turning, you start saying to yourself, maybe I had it wrong. Matthew 16, this is just two verses, 27 and 28. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of His Father with His angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Isn't that Daniel 12? Of course it is. Lots of other things too, by the way. But notice verse 28. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And we want to, what do we want to do? We want to, because verse 28 has bold letters on it, we want to say, oh, it's something different. It's a transition verse. Wasn't it convenient that every time we don't like what the Bible says, we make a transition verse? We do it in Daniel chapter 11. We do it in Matthew chapter 24. We do it right here. Everywhere we don't like what the Bible says, we just, whoa, we're just going to transition to something else. Why don't we just stay with what the Scriptures say? Jesus was paralleling here. Verse 27 and 28 is, is a Hebrew concept of how they would speak, how they would write. They would say one thing, they would come back and say it just the other way. Uh, say it the same way in a different way. We do the same thing. We write a love letter to our honey. Honey, I love you. Let me count the ways. <laughs> kind of deal. And this here is exactly the same thing. So what was Jesus saying? This is one of those things that just really made me stand up and listen. He said, there are some of those who are standing here who will not die. They will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. It's funny how we're going to see the Son of Man coming. This is their argument from Acts chapter 1, 9 through 11. They don't say that they see Him here. When they say that it was Pentecost, did they see Him? Well, are they going to be consistent or not? Well, that's right. Yeah. They're not going to be consistent. Let me go back to Luke 21 because I still have I'm only halfway through this. <laughs> now I see what problem you all had here. No. We, we can... <laughs> We can get this. 500 years now. About 500 years? Okay. <laughs> that is a thousand years. I get it, Hulk. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're here in this section, from uh, starting in verse 20. Now, let me read this. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies and recognize her desolation is near, then those who are Judea must, not flee, or must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are the days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those, in those days. For there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There's so much here that I could probably talk. Uh, I could probably get an hour out of this. I'm sure Holger could get, what, a week's meeting out of it? <laughs> Okay, but let's let's look at some of these other elements. Okay, so he says these things are written that will be fulfilled. Notice what he says, verse twenty-two. Because these are the days of vengeance, so that that all things which are written will be fulfilled. The first thing I want to show you is Matthew chapter five. If you're not familiar with these verses, I have to turn to them. I have to see them. I love that. Verse 17, Matthew 5. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now, either we're going to believe Jesus, or we're going to follow this failed paradigm of not believing anything that God has to say, because God is some kind of wishy-washy parent that never means what He says. 
You ever hear these parents who look at their kids and say, well, you're grounded for the rest of your life. <laughs> well, that's unrealistic. So the next day or the next hour or the, or the kid just goes on it right on and does what he wants to because he knows his parent didn't mean what he said. Did God mean what he said to Adam? The day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Amen. You better believe he meant that. As much as he meant the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be open. So which one did he mean and which one did he not? It's the same day. Was Adam's eyes open that day? Yes. Did Adam die that day just as God promised? Yes. No question about it. And all we have to do is look and see how he died. It was that spiritual death. He died. He was separated from God. Isaiah 59, verse 1. <coughs> but I can't get off on that tangent. He was just <laughs> fulfill all things. Verse 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Heaven and earth is this old covenant system. One of the, my favorite proofs for this is Deuteronomy chapter 31. And I won't take the time to go over there, but I want you to understand Deuteronomy 31 illustrates for us that the law of Moses is a witness. It starts in about verse 29 or so, maybe. Mm -hmm. Illustrates that the law is a witness. Put it inside of the ark that it may be there, remain there's a witness against you. And then, uh, what, two verses down later? He says that heaven and earth will witness against him. Well, what's heaven and earth? The law. So what's the law? Heaven and earth. Now, when we start understanding that heaven and earth can be used in a figurative sense, in a way that they would speak to use to uh, uh, describe things, then guess what? <coughs> heaven and earth takes on a new meaning in 2 Peter 3, doesn't it? Amen. Absolutely. <coughs> These are the days of vengeance. I need another hour. How can I do this quickly? Let's talk about some, some of this vengeance. I think I want to go to Isaiah 61. Let's talk about a little bit of vengeance that's going on here. So in Isaiah 61, here we see, and I'm just going to say what I think about this. Verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God uh, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. Hmm. Liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners? Hosea 13? Interesting. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. So when are these things going to take place? Maybe we can put two and two together. Maybe I'm seeing something there that, uh, that I'm not. I don't know. But what about, uh, we were in Isaiah 34. I should have went here first probably. But look at Isaiah 34, because I'm going to go through the whole chapter of Isaiah 34, but I can't. <laughs> but notice here what he says in Isaiah 34. He talks about all of this, the skies being rolled up and the... Uh, as a scroll in verse 4, it talks about his sword being satiated from heaven and judgment upon Edom and all these people and, then, and have been devoted to destruction. Isn't this amazing? This is the language that's being described here about this vengeance. And he's saying that this vengeance is going to take place at this time. And I know some of the other speakers have already addressed this. So let's move on from here and talk about some of these other things with the remaining time that I have. What about these times of the Gentiles? The times of the Gentiles. Uh, when I first started studying this, I was looking at Romans 11, and I was thinking, are these the same concepts? And it's not. Okay, there's a difference between the Gentiles being accepted now, and I think that's what Romans 11 is talking about, but these times of the Gentiles, what were they doing? Well, Jesus said, they're going to be the ones to come and trample the city. They are the ones. Now, Revelation 11, 2 teaches this, and you have to see this. If, if you're not familiar with this, um, you just have to see it. Listen. Look at Revelation 11. Verse 1. There was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. So here's a good proof text, internal evidence that the book was written before the temple was destroyed. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months, time, times, and half the times. That's 42 months. So here he says it's the Gentiles 
who are going to tread underfoot the holy city. That's essentially all that he's talking about. In verse 25, he says, There will be signs in sun and moon and stars in the earth, dismay among nations and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and of the waves, men fainting from fear and ex uh, expectation of the things which are coming <coughs> upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Now I need another hour for this one at least. I'm working on it. What are all these signs? We've talked about these signs. By the way, do you realize that Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, here's a sign, the sign of Jonah. And he said, I am that. You're going to see me fulfill this sign. Then you should realize that, that that's when these things you know, really are going to start getting good. And he says these things, these expectations of things are coming upon the world. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Essentially, all he's saying here is, is these rulers, these systems that are set up, this, these governments are going to be shaken. That old covenant world, shaken to the core. Then he says, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and great glory. Well, did this happen at Pentecost? We addressed this just a moment ago, but the answer to this is no, it did not happen at Pentecost. There's a lot of things. If we want to place the kingdom coming at Pentecost. Now, I don't doubt that the kingdom started on Pentecost. I don't doubt that at all. Let's look at a couple things. Matter of fact, let me show you something. This is the way I see things. Matthew chapter 3. Here's what John said. Repent, verse 2, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <coughs> he, said, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what does at hand mean? Well, maybe at hand means, oh, it's a couple million years away or 2,000 years away. By the way, about this, everyone expecting the Lord to come back in their lifetime. Did your grandparents expect the Lord to come back in their lifetime? I know mine did. I know they did. What about your great-grandparents? Did they expect the Lord to come back and put an end to all these things in their lifetime? Yes, they did. What about your great-great-grandparents? Well, we could go back 49 generations to the first century. And what about all those generations? Expecting that the Lord was going to come back in their lifetime. Were they disappointed? Well, Romans chapter 5, I think it's verse 5, says that hope does not disappoint. Fulfillment is where it's at, guys. Mm -hmm. Fulfillment. That all things have been fulfilled. <clears throat> so what about this? He says, the powers of the heavens are going to be shaken and the Son of Man see him come up with power and great glory. Let me point this out. If that was completely fulfilled in seven, or I'm sorry, uh, the day of Pentecost, where was the first ink put to paper for the scriptures to be written? Boy, that's, real, that's the kingdom coming in power there. Nothing had been written yet. Now wait a minute. So the Jew, I'm sorry, the Gentiles had not yet been accepted on the day of Pentecost? Was it, what, 8 or 9 or 10 or 12 years later, whatever it actually is, I don't know. Until Acts 10 for Cornelius? So the kingdom came with power and great glory when the Gentiles still didn't have salvation being preached to them. The written word had not been completed. That doesn't make sense. Isaiah 66 teaches us clearly that a nation cannot be built in a day. It takes time. <clears throat> Did these things begin, have a beginning, and then have a culmination? Yes. Hebrews 9 teaches that this was the culmination or the consummation of the ages. This is when all of these things were taking place. And for us to think that all of a sudden the law of Moses just is gone just like that, there was no transition period, does not make sense. God never did that. Hebrews 9, notice what verse 26 says. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away the sacrifice of himself. So Jesus came, why? To bring things to an end. 
The first time he came. Now think about this. There's a first time that Jesus came and a second time that Jesus came. We're going to see this here in, in Hebrews. The first time Jesus came was to deal with, with the problem of sin and to make the atonement and so forth. We get that. Did you ever notice that in Hebrews 9, you have Jesus ascending into heaven and he never descends from heaven in Hebrews 9? Have you ever noticed that? Jesus goes into the heavens. He goes into the holy place. He makes the sacrifice, and then there's the atonement and so forth. But we don't see him coming out of heaven in Hebrews 9. It's prophesied that, or well, predicted that he will, or said that he will. When is the second time? Verse 28, So Christ also having been suffered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. So when he were to come the second time, that's when salvation... According to Luke chapter 21, comes. Did you notice that? Recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Did you see that? He said all these things are to begin to take place in verse 28. He says your redemption is drawing nigh. I really wanted to develop that idea of redemption from Romans 9 and Romans 8. I just don't have the time. And let's talk about the rest of this. So he told them a parable of the fig tree and the trees, and as soon as they put forth the leaves, you see it, and you know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, do you see who he's talking to? He says now, and he says you, you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Do you believe that Jesus said what he meant and meant what he said? There's the question. He said all of these things are going to happen in this generation. Where's the transition verse in Luke chapter 21? <clears throat> We don't find one. Why? Because there isn't one. There's not one in, in even the other accounts either. Jesus said what he meant. He meant what he said. And guess what? That's what took place. Through faith, I have to believe that. I have to believe that when Jesus said, I'm going to come back in your lifetime, there will be some of you standing here who will not taste death until you see that event take place. What else could he have meant? Maybe Jesus was just tricking us. I actually heard someone say that Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, essentially, I'm going to paraphrase, conspired together <laughs> to trick every successive generation so he were to return 2,000 years in the future just so that they would stay faithful. I don't serve a God of tricks. Amen. I serve a God of fulfilled promises. Amen. That's how I know that I can be saved today. If these things are the way that our brethren often preach, then we have no assurance. That's right. We have no assurance. But through the scriptures, we have assurance. And we know that we can be saved. I want to illustrate one final thing about this before I move on. In verse 34, he said, Be on your guard, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life, that that day would come upon you suddenly like a trap. This is exactly 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, first 11 verses or so. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of all the earth, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about, this is the word mellow, to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. I want to tell you how I feel about mellow. Jesus said, I'm coming back in your lifetime. This generation will see this. And every single time that the apostles and New Testament writers are using uh, this word mellow in an eschatological sense, is referring, this is how I see it, is referring back to Jesus' promise, I'm coming back in your lifetime, and it's about to happen. Amen. Not today. I have news for you. You can rest your head tonight on your pillow and know that Jesus will not part the clouds. I know this is blasphemy. <laughs> Jesus is not going to part the clouds with the loud sound of a trumpet blast. It's not going to happen. He's not going to descend. By the way, you ever realize in Acts chapter 1? No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I know I'm way out of time. 
Anyway, he said, you need to be on the alert. You need to be on guard. I want to show you something from Hebrews 9. Let's go back over here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading out of here. But I do want to make a point. If this temple in the first century was not destroyed, never to be rebuilt again, as the scriptures promise, you and I cannot have salvation. Let me illustrate this. In Hebrews chapter 9. Verse, verse 6. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle. Remember we were opened by talking about the temple and, and what it looked like and so forth. As you walk through the temple, the doors will get successively bigger and bigger, more impressive. The gold that was on these doors, one of those doors apparently uh, so heavy it took 21 men <coughs> to open this door. So that's what we're picturing here. Performing the divine worship, but into the second... <coughs> Only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, but he offers uh, for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. And the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. So that outer tabernacle is still standing. It's still standing in Revelation. These things are supposed to take place. All of these things are going to happen. Jesus said its desolation is near when you see the army surrounding the city. You need to get out of there because your salvation is getting ready to happen. Now, let me bring this home with one verse that I saw recently that had a lot of power for me. John chapter 4. Jesus makes a comment here talking to the woman of Samaria. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming and when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Did you hear what I just, what I just read Jesus said? There's an hour coming when you will never again worship in this mountain. Mountain. Now, when did that happen? All we have to do is look at history. Let's go backwards in history. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Nothing there. Nothing there. And then we get to AD 70. And guess what happened? The temple's destroyed in that mountain. And you never go there and worship again. If that temple was still standing. If that temple, temple would still be rebuilt, then we have to go through all these things again. Are we going to have Jesus come back and have to crucify him all over again sometime in the future? It's a lot of things to think about now, isn't it? If that were the case, we need to be buying some goats and <laughs> doing all these sacrifices. Salvation is because and has come because <coughs> we can be saved because and we can have assurance of salvation because <coughs> of the fulfilled promises. <coughs> One last verse. I'm done. Revelation 19. Verse 10, the last part of that says, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If Jesus' prophecies did not come true in the time frame he said they would come true, then, friends, we should not be listening to him. That's right. You know why I listen to him? Because they came true. It's just that simple. There's no way around it. If we're going to put the prophecies of Jesus somewhere off in the future, then we might as well join the ranks of, of uh, such influential men as, uh, I just went blank on the Hal Lindsey. Uh, Hal Lindsey? Uh, no, I wasn't thinking about Hal Lindsey. Uh, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. She is Lewis. Yes. He said Matthew 24, verse 34 is the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. Because Jesus had no clue. He says in one verse, I, I'm just paraphrasing this. He says in one verse, he says he's coming back. Then another verse, just uh, so many words later, he says he doesn't know when he's coming back. Well, which one was it? Jesus knew exactly what he wanted us, us to know. He used the language that they were speaking in the first century to, to communicate that so that they would get it, and they did. So guess what? I believe that all those things that Jesus said came true. Okay, first I'd like to uh, express my thanks and glory to God for allowing us all to come here today and assemble in this place. 
to come together as a church to lift up the name of the Manchus. I want to express my thanks to the congregation here, Brother Brent, Brent, your wife, the entire congregation for the love and the hospitality that you all have showed us. As Brent said, I met him about over a year ago through Brother Bazin. Um, I was studying, seeing things in the scriptures that did not add up to what I was always taught. Started looking on the internet, found Brother Bazin and some videos that him and Brother Holger did, and I reached out to him, and he gave me Brent's phone number, and ever since then, we've been talking to each other, studying with each, with each other, and we developed a great friendship that I'm very thankful for. And as a result, I've developed a friendship with these young men here, and I'm very thankful, and a friendship with you all as well, so I'm very thankful for that. Amen. I also want to give thanks to my wife, Julie, and my son, John, my young daughter, Julie, for traveling with me. She's is truly my best friend and has been my support in all endeavors of life. She's really, as we say, she really holds me down. <laughs> she really holds me down. It makes my life a little bit easier. And I know when I'm gone, um, her life is a lot more hectic, but I'm very appreciative to have her. So we've heard some very, very good teaching thus far. And I hope that the teaching that I give you today will be just as edifying. As you can see here on the board, I've been tasked with the text of Matthew chapter 13, 30 through 24, and verses 37 through 43, the week of tears. But before we get engaged in this text, there are some rules of engagement. We need to know what we're dealing with. And just by looking at the screen here, we know that we're dealing with a parable. What is a parable? Strong defines a parable as a similitude a fictitious narrative of common life conveying a moral dodge comparison, a figure, parable, proverb. Simply, Christ uses an earthly illustration to convey a spiritual reality or a spiritual truth. And whether we understand these parables or not, they have meaning. Now, I've discussed parables with brothers in my church, other brothers within the congregation of Christ. And I get this response at times. It's just a parable. It is not just a parable. These parables offer a meaning. But there's a basic method of interpretation that we have to take when we're looking at these parables and any other scripture. First, we have to understand who's talking. We have to find out who is the speaker speaking to. What is the subject matter? When will the event that they are speaking about, when will that take place? Why will it take place? Where will it take place? And most importantly, what impact will it have on the original audience? And what are the results of its fulfillment? I think a lot of times we don't think about that. We leave out what impact it has on that original audience and the results of its fulfillment. So we're going to take a look at these things and keep those in mind as we go through this lesson. So why did Jesus talk to his disciples in parables? The disciples asked that very same thing. And in verse 11 he says, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it was not given. For whoever has to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, for they do not understand. Christ is talking to them about faith. They believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. More faith would be given to them through the teachings and through the inspiration of the Spirit, as we'll see. But those disciples, they didn't believe and understand the Scriptures. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So the faith that they had, it would eventually be taken away. Verse 15, for their hearts of his people has grown dull. They were lacking faith. And we still have that problem today. We read the scriptures, we read the parables, but people do not see. They do not perceive what the scriptures are telling them. They do not hear. They don't have understanding because they're not looking and trying to really truly understand what Christ is telling us. So this is our text. It says, Another parable he put forth saying to them, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed a seed in his field. 
But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So when the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? Let them both grow until the harvest. And at that time, I will say to the reapers, first, gather together the tares, bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. The disciples at that time quite did not understand the parable. So they asked so in verse 36. Explain this to us in verse 37. He answered them, He who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned into fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all the, all the, all the things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. And will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be a wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth like the sun as the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears, <coughs> let him hear. Before we try to understand any text or any parable, we want to try to grab all the information concerning that particular subject. So we're going to look at the parallel verse of Mark. And when we look at this comparison, notice what Mark says. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter a seed on the ground. And he should sleep by night and rise by day. The seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So when we look at these two accounts, we find this concept, this, this idea of growth. In verse 30, he says, let them grow into the harvest. So when we look throughout the New Testament, we find this idea of growth. We find this idea of maturity, whether it is talking about the kingdom of God or the sons of the kingdom. So we're going to take a look at this concept. Christ offers a parable concerning the kingdom of God. In Matthew 13, 31, he says, and he put forth another parable saying to them, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which is indeed the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the earth and becomes a tree, so that all the birds of the air nestle into it. So we find this idea of growth, we have a mustard seed. And in Matthew chapter 24, 14, it says, when the gospel goes out into all the world, then the end will come. So we have this idea of the kingdom spreading, starting in Jerusalem and Judea, and going out to the uttermost parts of the earth, growth. But we're gonna focus today on the sons of the kingdom. He says, that seed that is in question in this text are the sons of the kingdom. He says, let them sprout and grow. That is to enlarge, to grow up. And the earth yields the crops by itself. These are the sons of the kingdom. First the blade, then the head, then the grain. And when the grain is ripened, immediately he puts in his sickle because the harvest has come. So we see this idea of maturity. And once the saints are matured, we have the hearts. So the harvest is the end of the age. That's when Christ will return. He will send his angels. He would gather the tares and burn them. And he would gather the wheat into his barn. That is the resurrection. <coughs> So I'm affirming and I'll demonstrate in this presentation that the coming of Christ at the end of the age when he said he would send his holy angels, 
He would judge the just and the unjust, i.e. the wheat and the tares, where the righteous would shine forth like the sons of the kingdom and their father. That is a resurrection taking place. That took place in the first century at the end of the age. And that event will be marked, it will be determined by uh, specific events that took place in our history. <coughs> And we're going to be able to look at the scriptures and see these particular events that took place. It is not a future event at the alleged destruction of the earth. And we're going to see that as we move through. So this is how we're going to get there. We're going to explore the concept of growth and maturity of the sons of the kingdom. We're going to explore the harvest, the end of the age, and what the scriptures in the New Testament call the end. And we're going to look at the timing of the harvest and the events surrounding its fulfillment. So these are the truths of the parable. We'll just take a quick recap. The good seed are the words of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19. Matthew 4, 17, Christ came preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. It is the son of man who sows the good seed. He sowed the good seed in the world, in the field, which is the world. The good seeds are crops, wheat. Those are the sons of the kingdom. Now, while they slept, the wicked once sowed tares. These are the sons of the devil, the tares. That's the same sleep of Romans 13, 11, where Paul said, it is high time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than we first believed. Brother John mentioned sleep in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 through 6, that Christ will come like a thief in the night. But Paul said, do not sleep as other men do. The angels are the reapers, and they want to gather them, but the owner says, let them grow until the end, which is the harvest. And at the harvest, at the end of the age, Christ will send his angels and gather the wheat, gather the tares, gather the wheat into his barn. And Christ said the harvest will happen at the end of this age. So he removes all those who practice lawlessness out of his kingdom, and the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. That's Christ, who is the Lamb, who is the glory of God, who is the light in the temple. Revelation 21, 22 and 23. We have to understand that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how our inner man is nourished. That's how we grow as Christians and how we grow into Christ. It is Christ's word that gives us life. And it was Christ's words through revelation that would give the first century saints eternal life. So let's look at this concept of growth. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, I therefore... The prison of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling, which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, and bearing, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope in your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is the miraculous. This is the same gift of the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. Same context of Romans chapter 12, where Paul is writing to the saints there in Rome, how they were given different measures of faith. And he goes on to describe the different miraculous gifts that they're operating in, being one body, but many members of the church. So Christ ascended on high. He gave gifts to men. Now in verse 11 he says, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building of the church of Christ, for the building of the body of Christ. When? Until we all come to the unity of the faith. That is the oneness, something that's whole. We're not going to always agree on the same thing, but we have the unity. We have the one faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man that is not a sinless perfection. That's not sinless perfection. That's G5046. That is to a complete growth, a full age, a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So they would be operating in these gifts, having these offices of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to build a church, until they have the oneness of the faith, the knowledge of God, until they would be mature. Because Paul says that we, Paul and his audience, 
should no longer be children. Now, they were adults. Yes, they were understanding what they had. But in its overall context, they were children in an understanding with the information that they had. John wrote, I do not know what we'll be. John was not written towards the end. That was an earlier writing. They had to get more revelation. So they would not be children. That they would grow up in all things in the Christ who was ahead, causes growth of the body and of mind itself in love. So we see this idea of maturity. And when we look at the weak materials, Christ said, or the text says, let them grow into the harvest. First the blade, then the head, the grain. And when the grain is mature, he puts in his sickle because the harvest has come. They will be operating in these gifts into the harvest. Paul, he writes to the Corinthian church. Same idea. Same idea of growth. He says, love never fails, but whether there's prophecy, I don't think anyone in one doubts that that's miraculous, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there's knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect, same word, when that which is complete, full age has come, then what is in part will be done away. They understood in part. They were given revelation in increments. As the kingdom was spreading throughout the world, they were being given more revelation. They themselves were growing into the fullness of the stature of Christ. It didn't happen all at once, as he showed. It did not happen on Pentecost. The gospel was not in all the world. They did not have every revelation from God at that time. It was a process that had to take place. And notice what Paul compares it to. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, look what he does. He puts away childish things. What would happen when the complete man, the complete information comes where they can be mature in Christ? What is in part will be done away from. <coughs> he will put away childish things so he should know as he is known. How is Paul known? As a full functioning adult male, as a mature man. So he says, We now see in the mirror dimly, but when they receive that full revelation, they would see face to face, they would get the complete picture. They will understand everything that God would have us know. And now I know in part, he only knew in part then, but then I should be known as I am now. Now, body, faith, hope, love, these, these three are the greatest there is to love. We see maturity when everything is face to face. That's when we get <coughs> half a complete revelation. And we have that today. Do we have men in the church? That just was not for the Corinthian church. That was just not for the Ephesian church. I heard, well, that was for that church. No, Paul taught the same thing in every church. Amen. That was for the entire universal church of Christ. The church by Christ. That was for his people so that they would grow. And they would have it, those gifts, those offices, those people operating in that fashion, until they were mature. And we know what happens when maturity comes. Christ puts in his sickle because the harvest has come. Now, is anyone going to doubt today, and I'm not talking about individuals, that the church, the body of Christ, is not a mature man? Are we still operating in an infantile state? No. The church is mature. We have everything that we need in order to be like Christ. And that's exactly what he's telling us here. In Revelation chapter 10, we have John telling a portion of the prophecy here concerning the completion of the mysteries of God. 
In verse 6, in verse 5, we see an angel he saw standing on the sea, on the land. He raised his hands to the heaven. He swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heaven, the things that are in it, the earth, the things that are in it, the sea, the things that are in it, that there should be no delay, that there should be delay no longer. Does that remind you of Daniel chapter 12, 1 through 7, where he saw an angel standing concerning those written in the book of life? But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the missions of God will be finished as he declared, some translations say, that which he declared to his servants the prophets. So here we have the days of the sounding of the seventh angel. That's a time period. The days of the sounding of the seventh angel. When he is about to sound, some, the, I believe the King James says when, he's a, when he begins to sound, if you begin to sound, you still have it sounded. Okay? When he is about to sound, the mysteries would be finished. Now that's not saying that all scripture is going to be fulfilled before the seventh trumpet sounds. The seventh trumpet is part of the mysteries of God. What he's saying here is that there will be no more secret revelation given to man. That will be finished before the seventh trumpet sounds. Amen. Now look what he says. Looks like I got ahead of myself. In Ephesians chapter 3, for this reason I call the prisoner of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. For you Gentiles, indeed, that you've heard of the dispensation of grace which was given to me for you. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. These are the mysteries that would be completed in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. By revelation. Those are the mysteries. By which when you read, you may understand the mysteries of Christ. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now been revealed, been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his holy apostles and to his prophets. <clears throat> That's what we have in Revelation 2 and 5 and 7. That is the revelation, the full picture. In the days of the sounding of the seven trumpet, in that time frame, no more mystery. No more miraculous ability. So where does that lead the seven trumpet? They have to be in the same time period. You cannot take it outside of that time period. So let's take a look and explore the harvest. In verse 39 it says, Let them, the enemy sow them as the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age. Therefore the tares are gathered, they're burned in fire, so will be at the end of this age. So we have the harvest, we have the end of the age, we have this age. Same point in time. These are not different times. The end of the age is not separate from this age. is not separate from the harvest. One time. And when we look throughout scripture, we find that the text uses the end, the telos. That is the same point in time. So let's explore. In Matthew chapter 24, which these brothers have already talked about, but like Peter said, by way of reminder, I write to you this epistle, I'm going to tell it to you again. <laughs> so they come to him, and they ask about the temple. What are the signs of your coming and the end of the age? What are the signs of your coming and the harvest? What are the signs of your coming and the end of this age? Now, that's not going to mean anything different than what we found in the parable of the week of tears. The harvest is the end of the age. That's this age. Jesus says, in verse 6, and you will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. There we have the end. What is the end in question? That is not a different end. That's not the end of your lives. Then you have the end. The end of the age is not yet. So I'll drop down to verse 9. Remember, who, who is Christ speaking to? Then they will deliver you up the tribulation. They will kill you, and you will be hated by nations for my name's sake. Verse 12, and the lawless will abound, the love of men will grow cold, but he who endures to the end 
shall be saved. Now, I've heard people say, well, you know, they had to live through it in order to be saved. <laughs> That's not what that is speaking about. He who endures to the end, he who remains faithful to the coming, to the harvest, will be saved. But he says, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, then the harvest will come. When the gospel is preached to all the nations, the end will come. The harvest will come. The Lord will put in his sickle and reap the earth. We find that that took place in the first century. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, and verse 23. Now, are there people today who are born into this world, third world countries, who haven't been preached the gospel? Yes. But does that take away from what this text says in its first century setting? No. Christ is talking to them at a specific time period, and he says to them, then, when it goes into all the world, the end will come. Just because somebody today has not heard it, or claim they have not heard about Jesus Christ, does not mean that this has not taken place. Amen. This was for a particular time period. And that's when the end will come. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, we'll just go down to verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in the heaven and the earth. So therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christ says, I'm going to be with you, disciples, until the harvest. I'm going to be with you until the end. Well, wait a minute. Christ was dying. He was crucified. He ascended into the heavens. How is that going to happen? In John 16, 7, Christ said it is necessary that I go away so that the Comforter may come. 13 and 15, he says, when the Comforter comes, he will come not in his own authority, but he will take what is mine and give it to you. So the Holy Spirit would come in Christ's authority. Now, if the Holy Spirit is under Christ's authority, speaking things that Christ is giving them, how would Christ be with them? Through the work of the Spirit. He would be leaving, the Holy Spirit would be coming. So when we hear people say on the day of Pentecost, that was a coming of the Lord. That was a coming. No, it wasn't. Christ left, Holy Spirit came. Another comforter. Now, look at Mark 16, 15. Same thing. Go into all the world, parallel text. Teach every creature. Verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into the heavens, sat down at the right hand of God, and he went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them, confirming the word through accompanying signs. So Christ says, I'm going to be with you until the harvest. I'm going to be with you until I return and put my sickle in the earth. <clears throat> but I'm going to do it by sending the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do it by confirming you through accompanying signs. Luke 24, 46, confirms that. Repentance and remission essentially preaching his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Look what he says, you're a witness sin. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, returning to Jerusalem to your due on high with power. That is the promise of John 14. John 16, 7. When he was sending the Holy Spirit. So Paul, who was an apostle, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, had no problem writing to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 4 and 8 that I thank my God always concerning you for the grace that was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched. You were made rich in everything in him in all utterance and knowledge. That is miraculous utterance and knowledge. As a testimony that Christ Jesus was confirmed in you. So as the disciples in Corinth went out teaching the word of God, only way people would know that they were actually saints of God is through knowledge, utterance, and having miraculous gifts. That you would come short in no gift, <coughs> eagerly awaiting the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who would also confirm you to the end. 
Now, what does it mean he will also confirm you to the end? Well, Christ said to his inner circle, I'm going to be with you into the harvest. I'm going to be with you into the end. Paul says he's going to make sure that you come short of no gift until the end. You also. Now, is, was everybody going to be alive? No, but he's talking to the church collectively. He's talking to the church as a whole. He would be with the church until the end. We have italicized words here that you may be blameless, but he would be <coughs> confirming you until the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The end is the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes these italicized words here kind of trip us up. It does it with some people in Galatians when it talks about uh, the gospel to the Gentiles versus the gospel uh, to the Jews. Same gospel, one gospel. The end is the day of the Lord. So let's look at the time of the harvest. In John chapter 5, verse 46, Christ said, If you believe Moses, if you believe Moses, you believe me. Because he wrote about it. But if you did not believe his writings, you would not believe the things that I say. If you could not believe, if you would not believe the things that you find in the Old Testament, if you don't have faith in those things, if you don't understand those things, you're not going to understand the New Testament in its full capacity. So look what he says. In Joel chapter 28, and we're all familiar with this text, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The sons and daughters shall prophesy, and old men dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also on my maid servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I'll just go down to verse 31. Well, verse 30, he will show signs and wonders in the heavens, blood, fire, and or smoke. So we turn into darkness, moon into blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. So Christ is going to pour out his Holy Spirit before the day of the Lord. What was the purpose of the day? Of, what was the purpose of the Holy Spirit? So that they could be mature. And when they were mature, he would put in his sickle because the harvest has come. Well, look what it says in Acts 14, 2.14. Peter standing up with the eleven in Jerusalem. 15, these men are not drunk as you suppose, third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He was living in that time that the prophet spoke about. Steve talked about it last night. The prophet spoke about the things that would happen during the time of Christ's disciples, of the first century church. This is that. And it shall come in the last day, says God, I will pour my spirit on all flesh. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's 1 Peter 1, 9 through 13. The old prophets predicted or told things not of their time, but as Peter said, on the things that are upon you. The salvation, the end of your salvation, the grace that is being brought to you. It was actively being brought to them, and they would see it during their time. So when we get to chapter 3, Behold, in those days and at that time, what days? The last days. I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them. There on account of my people, my heritage, whom they are scattered among the nations, they, will, they have also divided up my land. Now Jerusalem was surrounded by the valley of Jehoshaphat. People always say, well, if it was only for the Jews, no. It was for all nations. All nations would be judged that day. Drop down to verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Christ is saying, hey, bring it on. Let's go to war. Wake up the mighty men. Let the nations, let all the men, let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares in the swords and your pruning hook in the spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Look what happens in verse 11. And gather all around. The writer says, then, cause your mighty ones to go down to the Lord. Who are Christ's mighty ones? Who are the Lord's mighty ones? Who's going to be his angels? The saints that come with him. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come down, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness.
wickedness is great, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. When will it be near? In the last days. Not near here, in the last days. That's when he's talking about it. The last days when the nations surround Jerusalem. He will come into judgment not only on Jerusalem, but on those nations. For the Lord will roar from Zion. That's the two Jerusalems that we spoke about, or that the gentleman spoke about. He will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will shelter his people and the strength of the children of Israel. What did he want to do for, for Israel in Matthew 23? He wanted to gather them. He wanted to shelter them. But they refused. But what would he do with his wheat? He would gather them into his barn. And Luke 21, 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know the desolation of <coughs> As he pointed out, that's Zechariah 14. That's Joel chapter 3. That's Luke 21. And during that time, when he would sweep the earth, all things written would be fulfilled. There would be nothing else to be fulfilled after that event. That's the time you have the harvest, when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies. There's no way to get around that. When Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, that's when the earth will be reaped. That's the Lord coming. He's sending his angels, and he reaps the earth. Look what it says. Signs, growing sun, moon, and then the stars, the earth, the stress of nation, perpetually is seeing waves. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. That's the same event of Matthew 24, 15 to 31, Mark 13, 14 through 27. That's the abomination and desolation. <coughs> Matthew 24, 19, in those days, sun will be darkened, moon will not give his light, stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Verse 31, he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds of one end of the earth to the other. That is the gathering of the wind into his bone. Joel 3, 15, then the sun and moon will grow dark, the stars will diminish their brightness, and the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Zion. That is the heavens and the earth will shake, and the Lord will shelter his people. Same gathering, same event, and the strength of the children of Israel. Now, Steve is going to talk about more about the heavens and the earth, and you mentioned it from Isaiah 1, 1 and Deuteronomy 32. If you look at Haggai, chapter 2, 6 and 7, he talks about the heavens and the earth. He says, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Verse 7, I will shake the nations. So if he shakes the heavens and the earth, and then he says, I will shake the nations, there is a direct correlation with the two. When he shakes the heavens and the earth, he shakes the nations. It was Israel's nation, the nation of Israel, that he would shake. And yes, he would judge all nations. All nations will be shaken. And there will be one nation. And that's the kingdom, the nation of God, his people. So he says in Matthew 13, let them grow <coughs> And at that time, I will say to the reapers, first gather the tears and bind them in bundles and burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. We can tie this all together now in Revelation 14. In Revelation 14, then I looked and beheld the headlamp standing on Mount Zion. I heard a voice from heaven. Verse 3, they sang a new song. No one knew the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who not defiled the women. They were virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb everywhere he goes. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God into the land. Verse 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst, saying that everlasting gospel is preached to those who dwell on the earth. Every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, Matthew 24, 14. <coughs> when the gospel is preached in all the world, what did Matthew write? Then the end will come. Verse 7, say with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. That's the end in question of Matthew 24. When the gospel goes out to all the world, the end will come. What's the end? The hour of judgment has come. And worship him 
who has made heaven and earth, seeing the streams of water. And who's being judged here? Yes, we saw in Joel that all nations, but the focus was who? Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen the great city. As he, Don pointed out last night, Revelation 1.10, Sodom and Gomorrah, Revelation 11.8, Revelation 19.1-3. That is the same city. That is <coughs> Jerusalem and no one else. And the third angel following him saying, if anyone worships the beast, well, I'll just go past that. So look at verse 14. After the gospel goes out to all the earth, judgment takes place upon Jerusalem. And I looked and behold, a white cloud. The one that sat, one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Is there any doubt of who that is? Who's going to come on the cloud with a sharp sickle or crown on his head? And another came out crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle to reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Matthew 24, 14, what is the sign of your coming and the harvest? Same coming, same event. <coughs> you can say, well, that's three different questions. So what? It's three different questions. So what? Matthew 13 says Christ comes at the end of the age, at the end of the harvest. So whatever Matthew 24, 20, uh, verse 3 is talking about, so is Matthew 13. And so is Revelation 14. The sequence of events cannot be any clearer. So, yeah, if you want it to be three questions, I really don't care. It doesn't matter because we see the events taking place the way they take place. So he who sat on the cloud, he thrust the sickle in the earth, and the earth was reaped. When Christ would reap the earth, he would gather the kingdoms of the world would become his kingdom. All those who practice lawlessness will be cast out. They will not be in the kingdom of God. And those who are in Christ will be gathered into his body. Those who are in Hades will be lifted out. Those who are on earth will be caught up in the air with him. The gospel is going on to all the world. The birds will nestle in the kingdom of God. It is a spiritual resurrection. They're not floating out of here anywhere. They're going to commune with God from that moment forth. So my conclusion here. The prophet Joel prophesied about the harvest. It's confirmed in Acts chapter 2. Christ promised his disciples that he would be with them until the harvest, until the end of the age. He did that by the authority given to the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 20, and Mark 16, 20. It was the Holy Spirit that gave revelation to the disciples, that allowed them to grow into the knowledge of the sons of God, to allow them to grow into Christ, to the fullness of the stature of Ephesians 4, 13. And those miraculous abilities will be there until the end. They would be there until the harvest, the day of the Lord. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 8. Revelation 10, 5 through 7. In the days before he sounds, the secret things of God, the mystery would be revealed. No more revelation, no more inspired men, no more inspired writers. Those inspired men were not inspired after the earth was reaped. The earth was reaped when the construction of Jerusalem took place. So if you want to say, well, John wrote it in 95, how is that possible? It's not possible. Just not absolutely not possible. Revelation 14 confirms Matthew 24, 14, the end comes of the gospel preach. We see the kingdom starting as a mustard seed and growing into a tree. We see the wheat, the sons of the kingdom, having growth and maturity. In Revelation 14 and following, the hour of judgment has come. Jerusalem is judged. Not one stone is left upon another. We see Christ reaping the earth, coming out of Mount Zion with a shout, with a roar, the sound of a trumpet, with his angels, sending his angels. The text it, it's all the same thing. And he gathers the tares, burns them, he judges them, and he gathers them. That is the end of my lesson.
I hope it was edifying and fruitful to you all. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, we always encourage to extend an invitation and encourage you to do so by putting on Christ in the graves of water baptism for the remission of your sins. And you can be added to God's family. You can commune with God who is communing here with us today. God is only the Savior of the body. And if you're not in his body, he cannot save you. So if you want to be saved, you want to be a part of God's family, we encourage you to do so. And, you know, a lot of people come to L.A. for a lot of different reasons. You know, people, they travel all over the world. They, and I know we're in part of it, but they come to California and they, they have dreams of being a star. You know? But you know you can be a star right here in God's kingdom. You don't have the least free to do it. <laughs> you can shine at a star in God's kingdom. And you can go forth and train others for righteousness. All you have to do is accept Christ's invitation, become a member of his body, and you'll shine like the stars. Well, as I was trying to mutter out, uh, words just fail me to properly express uh, the honor that I feel to uh, be invited to come and speak to you. Uh, I sincerely appreciate the spectacular hospitality that has been shown me and uh, Brent, Sherry, and uh, everybody. It's such a warm uh, welcome from everybody. And then uh, to meet some more uh, of brethren that have only known through Facebook. Uh, it's great to uh, meet you and to be in your company. And that we can share thoughts together and to learn. And that's where I'm at. I'm way down here <laughs> uh, coming up, trying to learn because I've only been in what full prayers for about a year and a half. I've seen some of these things for close to 30 years. But when I came to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, of course, Revelation 21 first, and then that straightened me out on 2 Peter 3, and then when I came to 1 Corinthians 15, as we'll see here in just a minute, uh, that's when my eschatology went out the window. And it's like, oh no. Uh, 25 to 30 years I've been teaching this way wrong. So I have been studying like I have never studied in my life. And you know, I tell people this, I have studied probably on an average of five hours a day, seven days a week for the last year and a half. And you know, that's, that's not bragging, and it's not enough. I have to work. But anyway, so it's, uh, I want to share a few thoughts here. I put this together for, mainly for uh, the brethren that I am associated with to endeavor to teach them that the resurrection and the judgment, primarily the resurrection, cannot be in our future. And I'll, uh, I'll get to that in just a minute. The text you see on the screen there is such an interesting text to me, not necessarily because of what it says per se, but for the context that it's in. Because it's in the context, when you back up to verse 19, verily, verily, Jesus says, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. Now, I'm old school, King James. Uh, unless you see on there, no otherwise. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. And you come on down, and this is in the context of where he's talking about the resurrection. Uh, Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, he says, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. And he comes on down. This is where he tells them to search the Scriptures. Search the Scriptures. Well, that's not New Testament. Search the Scriptures. And then we see this principle here where he says, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So 
the principle I want us to see is, and this was my problem, if we don't know what Moses and the prophets said, then how can we understand, how can we believe in the writings of Jesus and his apostles? And again, that's why I say that was my problem. I didn't know these things were in the Old Testament. I already had the concept for years and years that all things written were being fulfilled in and by the fall of Jerusalem. Luke 21, 22. But, like I said, I just I didn't realize that these things were prophesied in the Old Testament. But anyway, we see that there. And then we see that John says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. A couple of questions I stole from Don. He didn't know it till now. Is the resurrection out of the dust of Isaiah 26, 19 the same resurrection out of the dust of Daniel 12, 2? And then, is the resurrection of the just and the unjust of Daniel 12, 2 the same resurrection of the just and the unjust of John 5, 28, which we just read, and Acts 24, 15? Do the scriptures teach that the resurrection of the just and the unjust is yet in our future, or has it already taken place? I propose that the scriptures of Moses and the prophets, taken in their proper context, reveal that the resurrection was predicted to occur in the last days of the Jewish age, was an old covenant promise made to old covenant Israel, and was realized in the first century. I will demonstrate my proposal five ways. <coughs> now since John said that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, then let's look at prophecy. I'm going to start in Isaiah 6 and just look at some little portions to try to set the context and the time frame. Arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Come on down a little further. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give the light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thy everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Hold on to that. <clears throat> Come to chapter 61 then. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the reason I have that in red is because this is the portion that Jesus quotes in the synagogue. And I handed him the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah, and found the place. And he read this portion that we just read here from Isaiah 61. It says, He closed the book, he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now what is remarkable to me, and what I have missed in this for decades, is as you keep reading, you see that the, the, the Jews became infuriated with him, and they took him out by force. They drug him out and took him to the brow of the hills while I cast him down headlong. And you know, I, I just never thought about why did they get so infuriated? Well, it's because they knew this prophecy. And they knew the portion that he did not quote. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. They knew the rest of that. And they realized that Jesus was bringing this prophecy and applying it to them. This was coming down on their heads. And that's why they were upset. Chapter 62, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burn. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Anybody know what that is? 
what is the only time frame in the history of the planet that this can apply to? Oh, that thou was rent the heavens, that thou was come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known, to thy adversaries, that the nations might tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things, which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him, which Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and he applies that to, the, to his ministry, and he says, but now God is revealing these things to us by his Spirit. Come to chapter 65. I am sought of them, but that's not for me. I found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts, which Paul again quotes, even names Isaiah, and he applies this during his ministry to Israel. A people that provoketh me to anger continually in my face, that sacrifices in the gardens, and burns incense upon the altars of brick, which remain among the graves in the log, and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh, and broth of abominable things is in the vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. And to me, that just reminds me of the parable of the Pharisee, the rich man of but went up into the temple to our prayer, and the old Pharisee told God how good he was. Behold, it's written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Again, this just reminds me of what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6. It is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Drop down to verse 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, you shall be hungry. My servants shall drink, you shall be thirsty. My servants shall rejoice, you shall be ashamed. My servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 8. When the centurion came to him or sent the servant to him, and you know, Jesus said, Well, I'll come and heal. But y'all know. I'm not worried that you can come under my roof to speak the word. And Jesus marveled. I've not found so great a faith in all of Israel. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith in Israel. No, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east, the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, look what we find in Luke 14. Then said he also unto them, then said he also to him that bade him, when you make a dinner or a supper, call not your friends, nor your brethren, nor your kinsmen, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made to thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. Why? For they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And you shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. And the Lord God shall slay thee, and call his servants by another name. This is, coined, this is my word here. This is a benchmark. Because, what again, what is the only time frame in the history of the planet that this can be talking about of when Judah would be slain, God's servants would be called by another name, <coughs> the Gentiles would be brought into covenant relationship with Jehovah. As we continue that he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he who sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, 
and because they're hid from mine eyes. For, conjunction, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. So again, here we have this concept of all tears wiped away. Alright, again, as we continue reading. There shall be no more thence and end for the days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like bullock, and the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Now, I've asked a lot of people a question about this text right here, verses 20 through 25. I asked them to read this, this portion of text, prophecy, and tell me which age it applies to. And sometimes I get an answer, sometimes I, they, they won't touch it. Uh, I even managed to ask Howard Denham that very question on this text right here. And after I got his hopscotch hermeneutic explanation, <laughs> He did finally answer that this applied to the Christian age. And you know, he's right. Did I just say that? <laughs> but he's, he's right. It can apply to heaven. You have a transition here from one age to another. And it can't apply to heaven unless you want to argue that it could be death, sin, marriage, births, in heaven. So this must apply to the Christian age. So the problem people get into, and what they fail to see is that they confute their doctrine because the resurrection initiates this, this scene of peace and prosperity that can only apply to the Christian age. No more tears. All tears wiped away. That initiates this scene. All right, now, look at Revelation 21. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sin. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, why, for the former things are passed away. And then verses 9 and 10 uh, just restates that the bride is the Lamb's wife and the Holy Jerusalem. So we see that Isaiah 65 predicts the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. John sees the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah predicts the former heavens and earth will not be remembered. John says the first heavens and the first earth are passed away. Isaiah predicts the creation of the new Jerusalem. John sees the new Jerusalem. Isaiah says the former things have passed away. John says the former things have passed away. Isaiah predicts that all tears, pain is wiped away. John says all tears, pain, sorrow is wiped away. So what we have in Revelation 21 here is a carbon copy. I know that's all that's outdated until my age. But that is a carbon copy fulfillment of Isaiah 65. Now, in verse 4, John said, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. In 1 Corinthians 15, 
in the climax of what Paul is teaching about the resurrection. In the climax of that teaching, he says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when, there's a time word, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then, a time word, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. And that's what threw my eschatology out the window right there. The saying that is written, death is swallowed up in death. And I realize that whatever he's talking about, it had to have been fulfilled in and by the fall of Jerusalem. So as we started studying, we see that he is quoted from Isaiah 25 8. He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from off all faces. So what you see is Revelation 21, 1 Corinthians 15, and Isaiah 25 are synonymous. These, or these, these texts, these portions of these texts that I have shown here, they are synonymous. Now Isaiah unquestionably posits the wiping away of all tears at the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, the new earth and the new Jerusalem in the last days, when the Gentiles come to the light and God's people will be called by a new name. John irrefutably posits the wiping away of all tears and no more death at the creation of the new heavens, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, which he identifies as the bride of Christ. Paul said the resurrection event would fulfill Isaiah's prediction of the swallowing up of death, the wiping away of all tears, which Isaiah also said would initiate that scene of peace and prosperity, which can only apply to the Christian age. Therefore, the resurrection initiated the Christian age, and it cannot be in our future. That really is the only argument a person needs. Because that proves it. That's right. And I've, I've proved it with And that was my point for going to Howard Dinner. If anybody could refute it, that'd be, he'd be the one. He'd be the one to try. He, he, he did try. Couldn't touch it. He did not touch it. But that's when I become stupid. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right, well, let's go on. Let's investigate some more. Since the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, let's look here. And remember John says, I heard the great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. Let's look at Ezekiel 36 briefly. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And then chapter 37 begins with the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, and uh, he prophesies over them, they stand up and become a great army. And then it continues in verse 11, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves. I will cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, then shall you know that I am the Lord, that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel, his companions, take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thy hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Will thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick. And they shall be one in my hand. 
and the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king of them all. And they shall be no more two kingdoms, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David, Messianic David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Now, look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols. For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell with them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He says, For you are, that's present tense, present? Indeed. It's present tense, just like God was living, is living, present tense. And notice in the green that Paul quotes Ezekiel verbatim. That this is fulfilled. Being for, is in process of being fulfilled. You are the temple of the living God. Now again, <coughs> John says, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He'll dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Again, that is what Jesus says. John 14, 23, the man loved me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And the term rendered abode there is the same term rendered mansions in verse 2. The only, the only two places that term is found in the New Testament. Since Ezekiel predicts that the resurrection will be the reuniting of the divided kingdom into the whole house of Israel, brought under one king and one shepherd, John 10, 16, can there be any question that this occurred in the first century? Since Paul cites Ezekiel's prophecy verbatim and applies its fulfillment in his present time, that is, during his ministry, and since John cites the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy of the tabernacle of God being with man, as concurrent with the wiping away of all tears, no more death, at the creation of the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, which he identifies as the bride of Christ, then the resurrection unquestionably was fulfilled in the first century, concurrent with the creation of the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, and the tabernacle of God being with man. <coughs> Again, since the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Joel prophesied that the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. A day wherein there hath not been ever the light, neither shall there be any more after it. Now, what does that sound like? Daniel 12, 1 and 2, and Matthew 24. You'll see this in just a minute, Lord will. Joel predicted that this would occur in the last days. 
Peter quotes Joel on Pentecost Day through inspiration and says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He should come to pass in the last days. There is a time for us. Saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I'll show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And because of Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, this is where we stop reading Joel. But when we continue with Joel's prophecy, we find that immediately following the portion that Peter indicated the fulfillment of on Pentecost Day, which was to transpire just before the great and terrible day of the Lord, which proves that Pentecost was not the prophetic day of the Lord. Joel continues with, For behold, in those days and in that time, indicating that the events he was about to describe would likewise be fulfilled in the same time frame of the last days. So as Joel's prophecy continues, what he also promised in those days, and in that time, that is, in the last days, at the day of the Lord, was the harvest. When he said, Put you in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. And we find this cited in the Revelation vision. In chapter 14, verse 15, John says, and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. To him that sat on the cloud. He didn't come out of the cloud. He didn't come through the cloud. He sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now notice the unmistakable prophetic connections here of the Son of Man sitting on a cloud and the angel proclaiming that the harvest is ripe, which is the identical language used by Jesus in Matthew 13, as we seen this morning in John's lesson, where he says the harvest is the end of the age, the reapers are the angels, therefore as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be in the end of this age. Emphatically and unequivocally applying the harvest to the consummation of the then current Jewish age. Now unless someone can demonstrate exegetically two end of the age harvests with the Son of Man coming on the clouds of both to reap the earth twice then these predictions are synonymous. Notice then that John's application of Joel's last day's harvest prediction is synchronized with the last trump. So let's back up briefly and look at a little bit of Revelation. We go back to chapter 8 we find seven angels were given seven trumpets. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So what do they do? They blow the trumpet. They sound the trumpet. And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with the flood, and things happened. That's the point I want you to see. The first angel sounded, and things happened. The second angel, the third angel, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, they all sounded in succession, and things happened. Then we come to chapter 10, and we're in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. When he shall begin to sound. So what's he doing? He's sounding his trumpet. That's the last trump. There were only seven. So he's sounding the trumpet, the last trump. And he says, The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. We come to chapter 11, verse 15. The seventh angel sounded. So what was he doing? He was sounding his trumpet. The last trump. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and which was and which art to come, because thou hast taken thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead and the time of the dead that they should be judged and 
that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints, to them that fear thy name, to small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. That thou shouldest give reward to thy servants the prophets. That's the same thing that Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 27. Come to chapter 14, we find the 144,000 uh, redeemed from the earth, the first fruits unto God and the land. Verse 6 I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting, what's that word mean? Having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him. For the hour of his judgment is come. Folks, well, this is concurrent with the last trump. This is in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. Worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of the waters. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, has fallen that great city. For also our Lord was crucified. So notice that John's application of Joel's last day's harvest prediction is synchronized with the last trump. The last trump signals the resurrection as per Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. And these first two points are concurrent with another, another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach on them to dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people at the fall of Jerusalem. Since the gospel to be preached to them to dwell on the earth cannot find its application at the end of the Christian age. Since the gospel to be preached to them to dwell on the earth is concurrent with the last trump, which signals the resurrection, then the inescapable conclusion is the resurrection cannot be at the assumed end of the Christian age. This conclusion is further reinforced by four synergistic facts. John said in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared through his servants the prophets. Paul points out in the Colossians that the hope of the gospel had been preached to every creature which is under heaven, and he goes on to say of himself, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind with the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, that to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generations, but now. When? Now. When's that? When Paul is putting pen to parchment. Now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, John is told that he must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, just as John also sees another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach in them to dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel would also be when salvation would come. As John hears a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation, which agrees perfectly with what Jesus told his disciples to be looking for in the days when Jerusalem would be surrounded by armies. For at that time, said Jesus, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draw nigh. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel would also be when Christ would come in his kingdom with power. As the loud voice says, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, which harmonizes perfectly with what Jesus says in Matthew 16, verses 27 to 28. Jesus said there, the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there is some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now this is particularly troublesome to the futurist paradigm because what it says 
is that the Son of Man was going to come at the judgment in their lifetime. So what we have to do, I mean, we've got to do something with that. It is too obvious. So what they do is they take verse 27 and say, well, that's talking about the Son of Man coming at the judgment. That has to be at the end of time. And then verse 28, some of them standing here, they're going to see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom. Well, that has to, that has to apply to something else. Pentecost or the transfiguration or anything but the obvious. But notice, this text has a parallel. In Mark chapter 8, notice that Mark, and this is the same conversation recorded by three writers. And Mark records the words of Jesus this way, Whosoever therefore should be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now notice, notice verses 27 and verse 38, the Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with the angels. The Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with the angels. See that? The look at Mark's record. When was that going to be? It was going to be in this adulterous and sinful generation. You see that? That absolutely refutes the idea that you can divorce these two verses from each other in Matthew. You cannot separate them. Of course, then the other parallel text is Luke 9, verses 26 and 27, where it says, Who serves to be ashamed of me? My words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory. And Luke is the only one that adds that little caveat here. And that is very interesting when we look at that. Because that also would occur in this generation, his generation, that he would come in his own glory. All right, let's compare that to the Old Discourse. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they, now again, this, this is basic grammar. What is the antecedent of the pronoun they? Tribes. All the tribes of the earth, they'll mourn. And they, who? All the tribes of the earth. They shall see the Son of Man coming in, not out of, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he'll send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, with the great sound of a trumpet. Now what picture does that put in your mind? And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, one end of heaven to the other, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And it's interesting that Luke closes the all of discourse with watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are about to come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Alright again, Matthew 16, 27. And I want you to look at the eminence that we see in these following passages. The Son of Man is about to come in the glory of the Father. We see the same thing in Revelation 1. These things must shortly come to pass because the time is at hand. And he closes the, the vision with the same thing. He shook these things. He's going to show his servants things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keepeth the sayings of prophecy of this book. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 27. Same thing. Now, Joel posits the harvest in the last days. Jesus posits the harvest at the end of the Jewish age. <laughs> Jesus said all those things would come on this, his generation. And John posits the harvest at the fall of Jerusalem, Babylon. John posits the fall of Jerusalem at the last trump. Paul posits the resurrection at the last trump. Therefore, the resurrection occurred with the fall of Jerusalem. Now, let's recall... Paul said 
The resurrection event would fulfill Isaiah's prediction of the swallowing of the dead and the wiping away of all tears. As we have just seen from 1 Corinthians 15, 53 and 54. Again, where he's quoting from Isaiah 25, 8, who says, He'll swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God shall wipe away all tears from off all faces. So, since it is unquestionable, that the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection of Isaiah 25, then let's consider the time frame of Isaiah's prediction. I'll just back up two verses. In Isaiah, where he says, And in this mountain, which is identified as Mount Zion, and just a few verses prior to that, In this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all the people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, and wines on the leaves well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from off all faces. So we see that the time frame of the resurrection will be concurrent with the Messianic wedding banquet. Now look at the parable of Matthew 22 where he teaches here that the kingdom of heaven is like to a certain king that made a marriage for his son. He sent forth his servants to call them that are bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them what you're bidden. Behold, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come to the marriage. They made light of it. They went their ways, one to his farm, the other to his merchandise. And the river took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they which are bidden are not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. Now look at Revelation. I'm going to back up just a little bit in it. In chapter 19, John says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These sayings are the true sayings of God. And then we come back to chapter 21, and we find... The bride adorned for her husband comes down to God out of heaven, the new heavens, the new Jerusalem, the word, the time of the wedding. So since Paul said the resurrection event would fulfill Isaiah's prediction of the swallowing up of death and wiping away of all tears, and since Isaiah's prediction of the swallowing up of death and the wiping away of all tears is at the time of the Messianic wedding battle, and since Jesus posited the wedding at the time when the king would send his armies to destroy those murders and burn up their city, and since John posited the wedding concurrent with the wiping away of all tears during the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that is the last trump, then the predictions of the resurrection unquestionably were fulfilled concurrently with the Messianic wedding banquet during the first century. Daniel 12, the Spirit, the, the testimony of Jesus is the Spirit of Christ. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, which Jesus quotes and applies specifically to the destruction of Jerusalem. Then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world at this time, no, nor ever shall be. What's that mean? Nothing like it before it, nothing like it after. That means there's only one possible application for the fulfillment of this prophecy. <coughs> and I found it interesting to look at Brenton's English translation of the Septuagint, of Daniel 12 to 1. He said, there shall be a time of tribulation, such tribulation as has not been from that time, from the time that there was a nation on the earth until that time. And at that time, Daniel says, at what time? 
the time of trouble. The time that Jesus quotes and applies to destruction of Jerusalem. Thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Folks, that's judgment. Look at Daniel 7. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in, him, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with, not out of, with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion, glory, and kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And when you go down and look at the interpretation of this, this was after the little horn would make war with and wear out the saints. So that rules out that this is talking about the ascension. So again, when we come back to Matthew 24, Jesus says immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Which he is quoting from Joel. We quoted verse 13 a little bit ago. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And Jesus says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now let us recall Matthew 16 again. And we look at this text here, and I pointed out to you that Luke. Nine is the only, uh, he's the only writer that includes this little facet here of when he shall come in his own glory. And it would be when some of them standing here will not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God that will be in this generation. So what I want us to look at now is, with that in mind, is Matthew 25. When the Son of Man shall come in the glory, in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered in all nations, and he'll separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. Okay, again, with this text in mind, look at Matthew 19. Jesus said unto them, and they were kind of arguing, saying, you know, we've left all, what, what's, what's in this for us? The disciples. And he said, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit on thrones, on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Well, what? What is the regeneration? What does that mean? Well, the word simply means to make things new, make all things new. Look at verse 5 of Revelation 21. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for well, these words are true and faithful. And he had just said and told, and he's seen the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the bride, which the bride is new. <laughs> the tabernacle of God is with men. Former things are passed away, no more death. That would be in the regeneration. Okay, Daniel 12 and verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And here we see the judgment and 
the resurrection. Daniel's prophecy here is the only prophecy which speaks of a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Therefore, I ask, is the resurrection of the just and the unjust, of Daniel 12, 2, the same resurrection of the just and the unjust of John 5, 28, that we just read, and Acts 24, verse 15? If not, then where is there a prophecy of a second resurrection, both of the just and the unjust? Paul said, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call hearsay, so worship by the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope for God, which they themselves also allow, that there is about to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Interestingly, Paul said the same thing regarding the judgment. He said, because he hath appointed the day into which he is about to, the King James says, will, he is about to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. But I want us to look at Acts 24 here. This, to me, this was really interesting. When you come on down and read, Paul reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come with Felix, and Felix trembled. Why did Felix tremble? Well, you know, the go-to explanation that I've always heard was, well, he was in sin. You know, Paul, he preached to him, preached a powerful sermon to him. He was convicted. <clears throat> okay, well, I don't really doubt that. But there's more to it than that. When we replace the original words in the King James, that the King James translators omitted, then what Paul actually said here has a lot more impact. And he reasoned concerning righteousness and temperance and the judgment that is about to be. Felix having become afraid answered. You see, the King James Version <coughs> left out the definite article and they left out mellow in this text. To me, this has a lot more impact because, again, he's bringing it down on their heads. This is about to happen. All before grip. He said, I now stand and am judged for the hope and promise made of God and our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hopes sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews, why should it be thought a thing incredible of you that God should raise the dead? Promise made of God and the fathers. That he raised the dead. Then in the following verses, Paul reverses his conversion. Then he says, Having therefore obtained help from God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first to rise from the dead, and that he should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So since Paul's eschatology was based solely on Moses and the prophets, since Paul cites Daniel's prediction, of the resurrection of the just and the unjust and posits it as about to occur. Since Paul told the Corinthians that not all of them would die before the resurrection occurred, and since Paul told the Thessalonians twice, but later, that some of them would be alive and remain of the coming of the Lord, and he prayed that their whole spirit, soul, and body would be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord, then the overwhelming exegetical evidence from the scriptures demonstrates the fulfillment of the resurrection during that first century generation. And we see that Jesus quotes from Daniel 7, Daniel 12, the Son of Man coming in the clouds, with the clouds, the great tribulation, the judgment, the resurrection, the time of the end, and all these things to be accomplished through the power of the people has been completely shattered, the abomination of desolation, and Joel puts him there and applies the day of the Lord harvest. He applies all of these things to the destruction of Jerusalem and the all of discourse. Since Daniel 7 is the only prophecy that I know of of the Son of Man coming with the clouds at the judgment, since Daniel 12 is the only prophecy of a resurrection of both the just and the unjust, and since Jesus conflates Daniel 7 and 12 into the Olivet Discourse, then Daniel 7 and 12 and the Olivet Discourse are the same prophecy by Jesus' own application. <coughs> since Daniel posits the judgment, the resurrection, 
and the time of the end at that time, that is, the time of the Great Tribulation. And since Jesus cites that in his prediction of the Great Tribulation, it lies the fulfillment specifically to the destruction of Jerusalem, then to deny that the judgment, the resurrection, at the time of the end occurred in the first century is to deny the very words of Jesus. And folks, we need to let that soak in. And our brethren need to let that soak in. To contend that there is yet another resurrection and judgment of the just and the unjust in our future, then it must be demonstrated exegetically from Moses and the prophets. Since Jesus posited the comparison of coming of the Son of Man on the clouds with his angels in great power and glory to sit on the throne of his glory at the sound of the great trumpet when the angels have gathered together his elect from the four winds to reward every man according to his works during the lifetime of some his audience, then the burden of proof lies with you to demonstrate that this is not the same parousia coming of 1 Corinthians 15, of 1 Thessalonians chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 2 Thessalonians 2, all of which Paul also posited in their lifetime. And since the parousia is always singular, since the parousia is the coming of the all discourse, since the parousia is the coming of all Paul's, or all Paul's epistles, and since the parousia is the coming of the day of God, in 2 Peter 3, verses 4 and 12, and since James said the parousia had drawn nigh, and since the parousia's eminence was in its last hour when John wrote, then I suggest that the resurrection, the judgment, and the second coming of Christ cannot be in our future. Thank you. I want to voice my appreciation. Uh, I have considered this a great honor, a privilege, and a blessing in my, not, in my life to come to California, a place that I wasn't sure I would ever visit or see. And one of the things about California, if you're from the Midwest, where I'm from, you always see California on the news. <laughs> but what you see on the news is the big events that's happening in San Francisco and L.A. And you, you, you see all these crazy rebellious, you know, uh, all the marches in the street of homosexuality. And this is the debauchery and the liberality. And, it, woo, and uh, man, you say, I don't know that I like California, but let me say this. I want to wrap you people up and take you home. <laughs> I wish I could get a great big old box and put everybody in the Springville Church of Christ right inside there and take you back to Ludington, Michigan with me. It's been a great honor and privilege. You know, I told John Watson and the folks in Indianapolis the same thing. When I'm here, I feel like I'm home. And I want to thank uh, Brother Carson, uh, one of the elders that serves with Brent. I don't see Brother Carson here right at this time, but Brother Carson, wherever you are, I appreciate you. I thank you. I thank Brother Brent and Sherry, their hospitality. Christopher, I mean, just everything has been absolutely exceptional. I certainly appreciate it, and I love each and every one of you, and I hope this is not the last time we get to see each other this way and visit and just have a great, great time. Let's get into the text. We began Saturday morning. <clears throat> In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, I was able to work through verse 9, where the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We established how the old heaven and earth was the covenant relationship of God with Israel, and we discussed how. God was holding out to the last moment to bring this wrath upon that old covenant world of heaven and earth. And we looked at the idea of the thousand years of when that would come, would be when the wrath of God would come upon Israel, and he would remove them. That would be when the thousand years would be as a day, and a day as a thousand years. And we're going to sort of continue, and then we can find that in Psalms chapter 90. And as we go into verse 10 now, with some of these things in your mind, Peter's reminded them about the things spoken of by the Old Testament prophets, by the Lord, by the apostles. We went through some of that. And as we continue this mindset into verse 10, Peter continues to write, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, into which the heavens shall 
pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Folks, this is the exact same language we found in Deuteronomy 32, the song of Moses, with God's wrath the coming uh, upon heavens and earth, the covenant Israel, their nation, and he would come upon them with fervent heat and fire to destroy them. It's the same language as Isaiah 1, again speaking to the heavens and earth, Judah, Jerusalem, and he was going to come with fire and devour their nation and their cities, verse 7 of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 7. This is the same language spoken by the old prophets, spoken by Jesus, that heaven and earth, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot until the law shall cease, till all be fulfilled. For verily I say, till heaven and earth pass away. Did you get it? The old law couldn't go away. Then he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. The gospel is eternal. It's going on eternally. The old covenant nation of Israel is going to be gone and now we've got the eternal, everlasting word of the gospel of Jesus Christ to guide all men everywhere through eternity into the glorious kingdom of Christ. The new heaven and new earth is coming. But before we get into the new heaven and earth, Peter uses a phrase here that's also found in Psalms chapter 90, which is another reason why I believe he's drawing from Psalms 90. Flip back in your Bibles to Psalms 90. Because Peter said in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In Psalms chapter 90, verse 4, the psalmist wrote, or actually the prayer of Moses, the man of God, which is listed in the Psalms, wrote this, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. What's going to happen again? Verse 7, We are consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath, are we troubled? Look at verse 9. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath, and we spend our years as a tale that is told. This watch in the night is exactly what Peter is saying in verse 10 of 2 Peter 3, that he's going to come as a thief in the night. But this isn't the only place we can find this, uh, this, this, isn't the only place we can find this phrase, coming as a thief in the night. You can find it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. You can find it in Matthew 24. But let's just cut to the chase. Let's look at Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, because Jesus said, I am coming as a thief in the night. And then Jesus said this, the time is at hand. He said, I am coming quickly. I'm not going to tarry. I'm coming, my coming's at hand, I'm not going to delay, I'm coming quickly. And one thing in particular that I haven't heard anyone mention in this lectureship, I'm sure we all are aware of it, but I want to remind you that the book of Revelation was written to the seven churches of Asia. That's who it was written to. They were the ones watching for this thief in the night event. They were the ones it would come shortly upon. They were the ones that Jesus promised, surely I come quickly, even so come Lord Jesus. They were waiting for that coming 2,000 years ago, and guess what? The seven churches of Asia are not even here today. Are they still waiting? Even is, did, did John, the apostle who wrote the book of Revelation, break his promise to those seven churches? Oh, they got, oh, he's coming quickly. The time is at hand. Oh, no, friends. This thief in the night was the coming of Christ, but it would come upon them, like 2 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, those who would not be faithful and listening to the directions of the Lord wouldn't know that night. But those who did listen to the Lord would be very aware of it, and they would know when they were in the last hour of it, and they would be prepared for it. They would see it. They would know it. And as Peter is writing this exhortation in 2 Peter 3, he's reminding them of these very things that were promised throughout all the history of the entirety of the Bible. That's what he's doing. He's reminding them of these things. And he tells them that this heaven and earth that now is, is going to be destroyed with fervent heat fire and all the elements thereof. Now, a good study of 2 Peter 3 and this burning of heaven and earth and the elements cannot be set forward without looking at the word elements. 
is the Greek word stoicha. It's found several times in the New Testament, six if I'm not mistaken, twice in Galatians chapter 4, twice in Colossians chapter 2, once in Hebrews chapter 5 at the end of the chapter there. It's alluded to in Hebrews chapter 6, the beginning there. It's mentioned here, but this word, this Greek word, elements, is not what I was taught my whole life. It's not what I believe my whole life. This word stoicha always refers to the old Israel Jewish elements of worship. Those old worshipful elements, those things that they had to partake in, those carnal things, the animal sacrifices, the, the golden menorah, the candlestick, the, the physical temple, all of those Old Testament items had to be destroyed and burned with fervent heat and fire. I was taught this is talking about trees. <laughs> the trees are going to burn up, you know, and, and, and the, the, the grass is going to, and the mountains are going to, and, and, and all these things, and that is not what this is talking about. In fact, you cannot find a passage in the Bible that talks about the physical earth being destroyed. It's not there. Solomon said, one generation cometh and goeth, and another generation and goeth, but the earth abideth forever. Paul would say it this way, that glory may be given to God through Jesus Christ in the church throughout all ages, world without end, amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. Time and time and time again, Luke 2, or excuse me, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Luke 1, etc., etc., the church, the new kingdom, is eternal, Isaiah 9. There's no end to its increase. It's not going anywhere. This burning of this heaven and earth was the heaven and earth that now is, that is reserved unto fire and unto those things. Let's read this again. The day of the night will come as a thief. The day of the Lord, excuse me will come as a thief in the night, into which the heavens shall pass away, the great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Look at verse 7. Let's go back just a little bit. Peter says, But the heavens and earth, which are now, by the same word, which are kept in store, reserved in fire, require. See, I used to read this passage like most people did. Well, heaven and earth is not. I'm on. That's physical. It's reserved in the fire. Oh, no, no. That's not the idea. The idea of heaven and earth, as we've been through several times, is the covenantal arrangement God had with Judaism and the old nation of Israel. Drop down verse, look at verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person do you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? If you knew that the judgment was imminent and it was coming upon you at any moment, what manner of persons would you have been? Peter is saying, look, we're, we're at the end of this thing. The, the time has come when the end is at hand. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. He's warning the people time and time again, you stay faithful. You, you stay, salvation has now come. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. You've been told these things. You understand what manner of person ought you to be. And you know, as some people, I, I've talked to some smart aleks about this, and they say, oh, since we don't know, well, since it's already come, that means I can just be as unfaithful as I want to be. I can do what I want since it's already come. Listen to me and, and get this. Do you know when you're going to die? Because whatever situation or whatever type of person you die in physically seals your eternal destiny spiritually. You don't know when you're going to die. You don't know how long you're going to keep breathing physical air into your lungs and remain alive physically. That's why God made this planet and people the way he did. He made us all where we could die at any time. That's why little babies die. Oh, it's sad. It breaks my heart. I hate to hear about that. Sometimes teenagers and adolescents die. It happens, people. It happens. 30-year-old healthy men out there jogging, perfect weight, perfect height, man, muscles, and they tip over with a heart attack. Life is uncertain. Death is sure. You don't know when you enter into the everlasting realm of the spiritual, and you best be prepared now. 
Imagine a world where everyone lives to be 100. What if God said it up that way? Everybody lives to be 100 years old. Learned this from Brother Hoover Neubauer. Learned it 15 years ago. It never left me, brother. Thank you. If God set it up so everybody lives to be 100 years old, why, we'd all be as wicked as we could be till we were 99 and a half, and then we'd all convert and go to heaven. <laughs> Death wouldn't be uncertain anymore. Why, we could live like, like the devil all of our lives last month. We were dead. Hey, my 100th birthday's coming up. I better do something here, right? But God made it uncertain. Don't think because the old heaven and earth has been burned up that there's not an eternity waiting for you right around any moment. It still could come in that way. And that's powerful, brethren. Look at verse number 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Peter was looking and hasting unto the day of the Lord. Oh, I just got to get this in here. I'll never forget. Four years ago when I saw this, I came out publicly and I said, Brethren, I think we've missed a few things, and I believe we need to re-examine this, because I believe... The judgment, the resurrection, the second coming of the Lord's already taken place. One of the first major arguments I got then, I still get it, is based on you're taking away our hope. <laughs> You've taken away our hope. We have no more hope. What are we going to do now? Basins remove our hope. And I called several preachers. We talked about this. I explained to them how Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, that our hope is Jesus in you, the hope of glory. And, and for anybody that's outside of Christ, they have a hope of salvation, getting Christ into them and them into Christ. That hope is still alive. It's still well. It's still good, brethren. I was talking to Garland Robinson on the phone about this. Editor of Seek the Old Paz magazine out of Tennessee. We were used to be good friends. I was thinking about having him up for a meeting. He won't even talk to me now. Yeah. Wouldn't take my calls. Finally, he took one. We talked about it a little bit. And here's what I found. The next edition of Seek the Old Paz, he wrote about the AD 70 theory, he called it. I want to talk about a theory. Let's get into AD 33 theory. <laughs> <laughs> but he said... They're taking away our hope. And here's what he said, and I quote, My hope is that Jesus returns with the trumpet and the clouds with the angels and burns this wicked planet up with fervent heat and fire. That's my hope. Whoa! That's your hope? You hope, let me get this straight. I just want to understand it. If anybody can help me here, I'd appreciate it, okay? You hope that God's going to kill your neighbors, He's going to burn them with fire. He's going to kill all your relatives who don't believe and are faithful. He's going to kill all your co-workers. He's going to destroy everything. He's going to send them to hell, eternal hell fire for the rest of eternity to burn in a wicked devil's hell so you could go to heaven. That's your hope. Doesn't that take away the Christian virtue of wanting to do good and serve others and do the best for them to, so that they can receive the same exact beautiful, wonderful reward that you have? He's going to take, you talk about removing hope. He took hope away from every single unfaithful person on planet Earth. It says, I try to remove it. Brethren, when we stop and we look at all these ideologies of all these men who claim to be faithful, you'll find it's like Swiss cheese. There's holes in every bite you take. You can't take a bite of their AD 30 theory without choking on a hole in it somewhere. And that's what you got to do. You got to choke on it because I can't seem to swallow and get it down anymore. <laughs> well, let's take a look at this. Let's continue to look. Look at verse 13. And nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth where dwelleth righteousness. Stop. Right here for another moment. <sighs> This verse, to me, was a huge stumbling block. Peter said, we look for a new heaven and new earth, we're into all righteousness. And my whole life I looked at that and I thought, well, man, I thought, I thought righteousness dwelt in the church. That's what I thought. Hey, repent, be baptized, every one of you for the remission of sins, right? And God adds it to his church. All the saved, the righteous, God adds it to his church. Peter's looking for a place where he dwelleth righteousness. 
a new heaven and a new earth. So all my life I'm thinking, how does this work? It's got to be something in the future. It's a new heaven and a new earth. But it's got rights. It doesn't the church have this? And I'm in a quagmire. I can't understand what in the world's going on here. Brother, let me explain it a little bit. The church was born on Pentecost, A.D. 33. She was born then. But like anything that's newly birthed, it came in as a baby. And it had to grow. On the day of Pentecost, there were no deacons in the church. They didn't come to Acts chapter 6 or 7. There were no elders in the church. They didn't come for many years later. No one on the day of Pentecost met all the qualifications of an elder. Not one man, not one woman, not two men, not three men serving as elders. I appreciate the good eldership here. But on the day of Pentecost, you would have never been, up to, been able to rear up faithful children being faithful as part of your examination as becoming an elder. They did not have that opportunity on the day of Pentecost. Gentiles had not yet come in. What kind of a salvation is it for the Jews only? I mean, I know we hear about this Israel only garbage all over the place. Anybody with half a brain can see that that is nothing but a pure stretch of a straw man that people are trying to grasp, I believe, to bring in universalism. And I think it's a sad, sad shame. <coughs> the Gentiles had not yet come in on Pentecost. What kind of fulfilled, fully built house of God is this anyway? You don't even allow the Gentiles in yet? What about the gospel? The gospel had not come in its fullness. Ever since I was a little boy, I was taught that the apostles were baptized with the full measure of the Holy Spirit. When they were baptized with it, they were immersed in it. They had it all on the day of Pentecost. They knew it all on the day of Pentecost. They could answer it all on the day of Pentecost. And I always wondered why Paul said, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Paul said we only know part of it when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When he wrote the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, he said they were still waiting for the full measure of the full stature of the fullness of Christ to come. They didn't have it all fully given on Pentecost. The church was born on Pentecost. But it had to grow to the full man. Peter was waiting for the full man of the fullness of the church, the new heaven and earth, to come... <laughs> Because there's where salvation is, in the fullness of the house of God, with all of his promises being kept and fulfilled, where now in we have our salvation. And the new heaven is, the new heaven and new earth is the church. Roy, I was going to go through this today, but thank you, brother. You sent me so much time in your last presentation. Roy went to Isaiah 65 and showed how the new heaven and new earth would come at the time when they would be given a new name, Christian, right? When was that given? 2,000 years ago. That's when the new heaven and new earth come. He went to Revelation chapter 21. He showed how the new heaven and new earth was the bride of the Lamb. Anybody that knows anything about Christianity knows the bride of the Lamb is the church. And the church has been here for 2,000 years. And if that's the case, the church is the new heaven and new earth. But the one Peter was waiting for was the one that was fulfilled when the other one was done away. The old covenant of Judaism would go, the new covenant of Christ would come, and it would ever more be here to serve mankind. I'm from Detroit, suburb of Detroit. I like to say that. Sometimes you say, you go to certain places, I never forget this. I went, I went back to West Virginia. I'm originally from West Virginia. We had a family reunion there, and I had this really cool t-shirt. I was about 22 years old. I was slim then. I was in shape, you know. And this, this t-shirt said, Detroit, where the weak are killed and eaten. <laughs> and I'd go to these places, and I'd strut around. You know, I was Mr. Tough Guy, right? And people go, you from Detroit? Yeah, they, they sort of back up a couple. Anyway, in Detroit, we're the motor city capital of the world. Detroit is known for producing cars, and I'll never forget this. In 1977, my dad took me to a Dodge dealership. Daddy ordered a new Dodge Ram Charger, four-wheel drive, burgundy. I was so excited I'm getting my license in just a year or two. This is going to be my Ram Charger, right? I'm going to tear it up. I mean, I'm not going to tear it up. I mean, I'm going to tear the roads up. <laughs> but Dad sat down with the dealer, with the salesperson, and they went through this list. What color would you like it, Mr. Bays? And you see, then you special ordered your cars. 
And then Detroit would make it special for your, to meet your requirements. <coughs> oh, you want red paint? Yep. You want a 364 barrel? Yes, sir. Four speed? That's what I want. Certain tires, certain this. Yeah, that, we went through this whole thing, AM, FM, stereo, with an A-track. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> and when we finished at, with the sales department, the salesman got up and he said, congratulations on your new car, Mr. Baisden, and it had not yet gotten onto the assembly line. Did Dad own a new car? He put a down payment on it. He had it in order. It was his, but Detroit still had to build that Ram Charger. Three months later, Dad calls. My new car in yet? Oh, Mr. Basin, we're waiting. Should be any time. Well, uh, what's the holdup? Well, it's probably in body and paint. You know, the chassis has been put together, the tires on it. It's coming through the line, and, and they're, they're just, you know, buttoning it. Listen, that car had to go through a transition from start to finish before we could get in it and drive it. Now, before Peter could get in the new heaven and earth and drive it, it had to be fully built with the keys and the battery and the gasoline and the tires. But God uses a better illustration than Detroit, Michigan. God uses the illustration as a house. Oh, you see, have a new house built. You have the foundation board. Christ is the foundation, right? Then you have the walls being built up, which Peter said, you <laughs> are the lively stones of this house, which is being built up. A spiritual house. It was in the building, and you, it, like a building, you get the foundation, you get the walls, you get the roof, and guess what? You might can move in then, but there may not be electricity, there may not be plumbing, you may not have carpeting on the floor, but people were moving into God's house the moment it was birthed, but it wasn't finished and complete with all of its beautiful amenities, all of its blessings, until it was completely finished. But this house would be eternal, where you could invite all of your friends and family into it to live there with you. That's the house that Peter was so longing for and hasting to see. Amen. And that's a beautiful picture. And we destroy it with some kind of AD 33 theology. We take and we, you want to talk about removing hope and removing common sense and removing honesty? My brethren have been absolutely terrible at being honest with what these teachers screw with, uh, with what these scriptures teach, excuse me. <laughs> they have been. Now, let's get to the other aspect of this, this new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, because this is where the rubber meets the pavement. Righteousness is only found in the new heaven and new earth. Get it. Righteousness is only found in not out of the new heaven and new earth. In fact, all spiritual blessings are found in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. The blood of Jesus is a spiritual blessing, folks. It's not a biological red crimson liquid that we ingest somehow and contact the blood of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, there the Apostle Paul said that the blood is in Christ, in whom we have redemption through his sins, through the blood. The blood is a spiritual blessing. When you're baptized, you're baptized in the blood of Christ, being washed in the blood, Revelation chapter 1, 5, which is how Paul come into contact with the blood, being washed, Acts 22, 16, why tell thou, arise, be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Listen to me, folks. When God, when Jesus hung on the cross, and that Roman soldier pierced his side and pulled it out, forthwith came blood and water. Hogarth taught how the water was turned to wine in John chapter 2. Excellent illustration. But brethren, God put blood and water together, and Jesus said, Whatsoever God hath put together, let not man do asunder. God joined water with the blood, and blood with the water, and if you want to get the blood, you've got to get the water. There's no other way around it. I remember a story when I was younger, and to this day, this story haunts me. When I was about 14, I heard this story of a marriage that was going to take place. I've never validated it. I've never looked into it. I was told it was a true story. This young man and one woman had planned to get married. 
They had devoted each other to each other. They had faith in each other. They believed in each other. They confessed their love for each other. They repented of seeing anyone else. They're dedicated to each other. The great wedding day comes. The groom is standing at the front. The preacher's there. The bridesmaids, the, the, the men of honor are standing next to the groom. The door is open and you hear the great wedding and the, the wedding song starting to play. <coughs> and here comes the beautiful bride at the aisle. And unknown to everybody, she had a heart condition and she dropped dead right in the middle of walking forward. The man she was going to marry was a very rich man. No doubt she had true love for him. No doubt she had true convictions to be with this man for the rest of her life. But she dropped dead before the wedding. Her family took that man to court and said, we want the inheritance of our relative who had died, who was married to you. Very rich man. We want some of your money. You see, she's our daughter, she, and we think we deserve part of what was rightfully hers. They went to court, and the judge said, they were not married. You get nothing. Nothing. But let's think about this for Let's just reevaluate something for just a second. Let's just say that God <coughs> saved someone without contacting the blood of Christ. If God saves even one person without contacting the precious blood of Christ, then God could save everyone without contacting the precious blood of Christ. He, in fact, that would make Jesus' death vain. That's what that would make. He wouldn't have to die to give his blood to purchase the church because after all, we don't need the, the blood anymore. We don't need it. And that makes God a cruel, wicked, mean God. If he sent his son to die, people could be saved any other way than through remission of sin through his precious blood. And that just will not work. There's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And the Bible says, if any man preaches any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. But we are an angel from heaven, preach it. Brethren, I'm telling you what the Bible says. And I'm not trying to make up any kind of excuse or any kind of scenario to walk around it, to enter in any other way. John 10, 1 says, any man that tries to enter in any other way, the same as a thief and a liar. Oh, no, friends, not here. Listen, I love eschatology. I love the coming of the Lord. But let me please admonish everyone in the world that's listening right now. Preterism is a belief within the religion of God. It's not the religion of God. Preterism is not a religion unto itself. And if it is, you've got the wrong one. It's a belief within the religion of God. Never lose sight of the purpose of the church. We are here to evangelize, to convert sinners into the beautiful, blessed light of Jesus Christ where they can never have to die again. Amen. And then, oh boy, the, and now we can use it as a tool. <clears throat> I spoke the other morning about converting a Seventh-day Adventist after several Bible studies of him saying, oh, I'm not giving up the Sabbath till the Lord comes. I said, I was hoping you were going to say that. I used it as a great tool. But the purpose and the reason was to get the man into the body of Christ. And by the way, that man died last year in Christ. Amen. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful baptism that was. So Peter's looking for this place where he dwells righteousness. This place where all, everyone came into contact with the blood of Christ. And it was the fullness, the full measure. Now I understand it. Now I'm getting it. Back four years ago, we told our friends, some of our very best friends, preachers and teachers that we've known. <coughs> One of the friends that I thought for sure we could talk to, he cut me off, he stopped texting me, he stopped writing me, he stopped calling me, he wouldn't take my calls, he, bought, he went on Facebook, said, Bezos teaching kingism, everybody's got to withdraw from Bezos. Holger Neubauer and I, we jumped in the car. Man lives in Virginia, we drove 800 miles one way to see that man. 800 miles. Here's the question, oh by the way, when he sat there, when we got there, here's what he said to us, if y'all don't leave, I'm calling the police. <laughs> 
And this man, by the way, was known, he has a television show, Johnny Robertson, right? He has a television show, What Does the Bible Say? He is known for going to, into every denomination within five or six counties of Virginia, North Carolina. And when the ministers don't want to talk to him, they say, if you don't get out of here, Johnny, we're going to call the police. And he puts them on TV and calls them cowards. He calls them hypocrites. He says they're too afraid to stand for the doctrine. But we're the Church of Christ. We're going to stand for the doctrine. Well, when Hogan and I got there, he said, if you don't, walk, if you don't leave, we're calling the police. You want to talk about hypocrisy? <laughs> but I'll never forget... I'll never forget, Hogar got one good question. He, he, he wouldn't even talk to us. Hogar said, I'm going to ask you one question, Johnny. Please answer. In Luke 21, 31, which kingdom was coming when Jerusalem's compassed with armies? See, his doctrine says it came in 33 in its fullness, in its completeness. We had it all then. Hogar said, I want to know which one came when Jerusalem's compassed with armies. That's the one Peter's looking for. The same one Peter's looking for. This new heaven and new earth with Jesus in the church? Johnny didn't have a clue. He didn't say a word. He said, if I was the apostle Paul, I'd strike you blind right now. Oh. That's what the man said. And by the way, I got it on tape. <laughs> I got it on video. He can't get out of this one. All right. This is not a different kingdom, brethren. It's the same kingdom grown up into the full man until unto the full stature, the full measure of the fullness of Christ with all the blessings that it has to offer, and I thank God for it. And it's a sad shame my brethren act the way they do and refuse it the way they do. Now, brethren, <coughs> we need to go forth and continue preaching the gospel of Christ, but now we also got more to help our brethren with, don't we? I commend this church. Oh, I commend the one in Indianapolis, Roosters, and West Virginia, several others. It's growing fast. We're getting people over. The truth is being victorious. Those who are honest will. Now get it and listen carefully. Those who are honest will. Those who are honest will. Those who are dishonest, they can have them. I don't want the dishonest people with me. God ain't going to take them. Why should he force them upon me? Oh, now i got to take the dishonest ones and have to deal with them every day with all of their <coughs> sitting in the pew and denying and laughing and calling me a heretic and, oh, i just got to put up with all that? No, no, I, no, I don't. No, no, you're going to be dishonest? You're going to withdraw fellowship? You have, let them go. If they're at that point, you know, the Lord said, cast not your pearls before the swine. <laughs> Give not that which is holy to the dogs, unless, they, unless the swine trample it under their feet, turn again and rend you. <coughs> Matthew chapter 7. There's a time to wipe your feet off the dust of time from certain people and certain individuals. And brethren, listen, if the Lord did it and the Lord commended us to do it, don't be afraid to take the stand and even stand alone as long as the Lord's with you. If the Lord's with you, you cannot lose. You cannot fail. You're not going to have to worry about a thing. You've got all the comfort in the world. Let's continue 2 Peter 3. Look at verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. You stay faithful. You stay committed. Oh, there's a crown of life waiting. We have the crown of life now for in Christ Jesus. We have all the promises our brethren don't understand how we are at peace. Oh, there's going to be no tears. Spiritually, I have no tears. I'm not scared. I'm not hurt. I'm not worried. I have great peace. I have no tears spiritually. I have Christ in my life. I have the blood washing me continually. I have no more death spiritually. And I, this is not hard to understand. I'm telling you right now, all it takes is honesty. If you can understand baptism for the remission of sins, you can understand how it's the soul that was buried in this sin and left buried. And it's the, the spirit that rises to walk a new life, right? And in Romans 6, by the way, a little off 2 Peter 3, but sometimes you just got to preach it. In Romans chapter 6, if you read those verses carefully, we don't rise in the likeness of resurrection. That was added by the translators. The Bible says we rise from that baptism in resurrection. That's right. I don't have to wait for it. I have been resurrected. That's why the Bible never says second resurrection. 
<laughs> says first. <laughs> says the resurrection. But after the resurrection of the just and unjust, when Hades is judged and the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord, the kingdoms of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord, resurrection continues onward forever because every time a sinner gets baptized in the water of baptism, rises to walk a new life, they are resurrected from the dead. And it's continual and it will never end. Resurrection continues after the great resurrection occurred 2,000 years ago. So if you remain faithful after being resurrected like Peter was, that's why he's hasting unto it. Oh, he couldn't wait to have it. Man, he could taste it. Look at verse 15. An account of the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. I got two points to make here, and I know I've taken some of your time. I appreciate your, your kind attention. But one of the first things I want to say about this passage can be found in Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, Peter was being a hypocrite, the Bible says. He was dividing himself from the Gentiles. He wouldn't eat with them, insomuch that Barnabas was even carried away with the hypocrisy, the dissimulation. And Paul said, when I came there, I rebuked Peter to his face before them all because he was to be blamed. Paul didn't play the games my brethren played. They didn't run around gossiping behind people's back and whispering in people's ears and say, hey, that Peter, that guy, he's doing something. And Paul told me this. And uh, what do you think about it? Paul went straight to him and said, I confronted him to his face before them all because he was to be blamed. And what did Peter do about it? Here's what Peter did. He said, oh, I can't stand that Paul. That guy's always on to me. Well, I just, I was just being a good, faithful Jew. I thought he'd come and he just, I, he did it in front of everybody. He made me look bad in front of all those Gentiles. Barnabas was there. He saw, hey, Barnabas, didn't you see Paul do that to me? Peter didn't do that. Peter picks up his bootstraps, and he opens his heart. He said, our beloved Paul, all oh, he's written about this, listen to him. Paul's a good man. And my brethren would have that kind of attitude. Could we move mountains? You better believe it. Well, you better believe it. With that kind of faith, with that kind of love, my, oh, my Peter, mm, what a great example of forgiveness. But the other part of this that I want to bring to your attention is that Paul wrote the same thing Peter did and that there's going to be people that read Paul's writings and they twist them to their own destruction. Anybody here ever consider 1 Corinthians 15 or Romans 8? Some tough stuff. I mean, it's some tough stuff. I heard three or four speakers say, well, 1 Corinthians 15, give me my hiccup. 1 Corinthians 15 is where I hit the brakes when I was seeing all these things. You go to 1 Corinthians 15, and all of a sudden you have to delineate which bodies are you talking about. You know, the body, Bible talks about many bodies. You've got the body of sin. You've got the body of righteousness. You've got the body of Christ. You've got the body of Moses. You've got the physical body. I mean, you've got corporate body. Which body? And until you start delineating the body that needed to be resurrected, that, by the way, we, meet, we being many are one bread and one body, and there's only one body, right? For there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called one hope of your calling, Ephesians 4.4. 4. That's the body Paul's talking about. Not your physical, biological bodies, but they twist that. They rest it to their own destruction. But Peter said, listen, Paul's saying the same thing I'm saying. What? <coughs> that the resurrection is a hand the end of the old heaven and old earth is now, the end of all things is a hand, 1 Peter 4, 7. Jesus is about to judge the quick and the dead, 1 Peter 4, 5. Ah, oh, Paul wrote the same thing. My brother and have them at odds with each other. <laughs> After Peter wrote such a good thing about Paul, how, how do they do that? Verse 17, ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, Beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. That is the message we need to shout from the rooftops. These people best be careful what they're falsely accusing us of because, brethren, we've got the truth. Right. 
And I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to shut up. And I'm not going to give up, as Brother Hoger said during the denim debate. And like David's mighty men, we're not going to give up one inch of ground. I'm not going backwards, fellas. I'm standing and fighting. And not only am I keeping my ground, I'm taking yours from you. That's right. We're going to take the gospel to the world, the truth of the gospel. We're going to bring the honest ones with us and the dishonest let them have them. Just let them have them. They can take them. Don't want them with me anyway. Verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> oh, boy. I could go for hours on each of these, but... <sighs> Growing the grace knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know what that means? Ultimately, here's, a, here's what this means. I might learn something new today I didn't know yesterday. I need to grow in my knowledge. I need to grow in the grace. Now, the question comes... If I learn something new today I didn't understand yesterday, what should I do with it? Should I embrace it? Should I reject it? Should I say, well, if I teach that, everybody's going to think I'm crazy. And here's what's going to happen. If I teach that, don't you know, I spoke with a man four years ago on the phone. <laughs> he said, Steve, I believe it. I see it. I'm right with you. But I'm 63 years old. I got two more years to go before I retire. And if I preach that, I'll lose my retirement. Shame. Yeah, it's a shame. It is. It's, but that's what we're dealing with. Here's the, here's the point, people. We come into the body of Christ as newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. And shame on us if we start getting a little bit of pinto beans and cornbread and we start choking on it. Look, <laughs> I, look, I, I'm a hillbilly from West Virginia. My family had pinto beans five nights a week for supper. And I love beans, but let me tell you, there's nothing like steak. I want the meat. And I can't get the meat till I can keep down with pinto beans and cornbread. Now, we've got to accept God's truths and grow. And what are we going to do with it after we see it? If we reject it, how can God be happy or pleased with anyone who sees it and understands it and still rejects it? That's dangerous. I'd say that's unfaithful, even sinful. No, brethren, I don't I know this. Like, like, like Peter said, I'm sojourning here. I'm on a journey for my soul. And I plan on learning something new tomorrow I didn't know today. And I want you to keep that in your prayers for me, if you would please. I want you to pray for me that I can understand understand things better, that I can teach better, that I can help others better, and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do the same for you. But for heaven's sake, whatever the truth brings, and whatever we learn tomorrow, don't put it under a bushel and hide it. You put it out where everybody can see it. Let your light shine. That's right. That's your lesson in 2 Peter 3. And I want to once again uh, petition the prayers of the good brethren of this congregation to keep us in your prayers as we're traveling home. And I want you to know you're not alone. We love you. I know you love us. <laughs> and together, together as the body of Christ, we're going to continue to grow and love and teach and preach God's eternal, undying, everlasting truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.